So um, today I'm going to talk about TCP info and TCP timestamping. Uh, I, I am by no means the most uh, knowledge, knowledgeable expert. Uh, Eric Dumaze, uh, Neil, Yu Chang, Larry, Willem have all contributed to this. I'm just presenting uh, as uh, one of the uh, contributors. Um, my slide is. So um, TCP info is probably, uh, if we exclude PCAP, is the most uh, well-known TCP instrumentation. Uh, it basically captures TCP state and the fields we care about in TCP. Uh, on the other hand, we have transmit and receive timestamps that we support for TCP. And there is a new addition to transmit timestamps called opstats, which is basically TCP info in timestamps, and I'm gonna go walk through all of these and provide a summary. So TCP info, uh, it's a socket option. If you haven't used it, it's uh, in TCP level, so you have to get socket on solve TCP. It's read-only, you can't set the fields, so it just gets socket, <laughs> that's obvious. Um, but there are fields in that struct that we have some setters for them. Um, it, basically have uh, a very simple uh, interface. There is a structure uh, called TCP uh, info. Uh, and then you just create that structure, pass it to the kernel, kernel fill it out, and then send it to you. Uh, the, the structure TCP info is a collection of fields. Uh, for example, minimum RTT, delivery rate, retransmissions, bytes, and uh, pacing rate, max pacing rate. Uh, and it provides a very important uh, uh, backward and forward uh, property, backward and forward compatibility. Uh, uh, this structure is append only. When we want to change this structure, add a new field, uh, we can only append to this, so it's binary compatible with this previous version, except for the holes in that structure. So we can, if we find a bit somewhere, we just reuse that. Otherwise, just append only. Uh, the get socket outland is also in and out parameters, as you know. So depend that length is very important on finding the version of TCP info. So um, this slide basically explains how we do backward compatibility. So let's say we have um, a binary compiled with an older version of TCP info running on a new kernel. What kernel does is basically in get socop, we call the routine that fills the structure for us, and then we copy the bits onto the user provided buffer. So if the buffer is just one byte, you'll get the first byte of TCP info. If it is 20 bytes, it's uh, the first 20 bytes. And as a result, when you're compiled with an older version of TCP info, you get the fields that you had in your structure in your user space binary, but not all the fields that kernel provides. But you still pay for the cost of memory bandwidth in the kernel because we set all those fields, but we don't just copy them in user space. If you run a new binary compiled with a recent, uh, recently updated TCP info running on a very old kernel, uh, kernel will just no, uh, field uh, the field that it knows, and then the rest of those fields are untouched or uninitialized. So you have to make sure you read the len returned by get uh as a reference for, the, for which version of kernel you're running on. Uh, so when you're on the uh, older kernel, make sure you check the len. Len would be uh, smaller than your TCP info if it has changed. Um, and uh, based on the offset of the fields, you can see which version of the TCP info you're actually using. And I'll explain why that is important later. So let's take a look at the structure in uh, the fields in that structure. Um, there are some fields that represent the TCP state. Uh, the first one is the connection state, like if it is established. Since uh, this is uh, uh, basically a, uh, a byte, uh, there are you can see the options that are negotiated. Um, you can see timestamping, ECN. Uh, what is the, um, like if we have received window scaling, all of that. 
Uh, you can see RTO in USAC. You can ha you have three fields for maximum sigma size. Uh, so why do we have three fields? The first one is advertised, like what we advertise to the other side. The next one is what we negotiated. So it's like the minimum of the two sides. So this is what the maximum segment size we can send on. So that's a send MSS. The last one is receive MSS, and this is very confusing for people who haven't used it. It can be a very small value because it's the maximum segment you have received on this connection. So for example, let's say I'm using a 9K MTU, but you're sending me ping pong traffic. The maximum segment I've received so far is just one byte plus a TCP IP header. That receive thing is basically the maximum of whatever I've received so far. Um, and this is very important for debugging if you're using variable, MT, like multiple MTUs in your network. Sometimes uh, some connections work because they don't actually use the larger MTU. They're just sending one byte and get, receive one byte. But the connections that are actually sending larger MTU sizes wouldn't actually be send the packets. So you can use this to, as a reference to see what is the maximum segments I've received on all of my TCP connections if you collect it on like, all of your machines. So for transmission stats, TCP has just too many retransmit fields in the TCP infrastructure. The first one that is in the, like, the first eight fields is TCP retransmits, but it's not really the retransmission. Because, and you can obviously see that because it's just one byte. How come TCP can retransmit up to 256 segments, right? What it is, is actually retries. It's basically the number of time TCP has installed on a sequence, on the first on act sequence. So I'm RTOing, I'm trying to send something, and this thing gets increased until this byte is act or a closer connection. So if, for example, there's a syscall TCP retries two, for example, if we reach that, uh, after that many retries, we just close the connection or abort the connection. This is basically the counter. If this counter goes above that syscall, we close the connection. The next one is TCP I retrans. That is also not the retransmission. This is the number of packets retransmitted in flight. Uh, not very useful for most use cases. The next one which we added recently is the total retransmission. Uh, by recently, I mean uh, about a year ago. Um, this is basically the number of uh, data packets that are retransmitted. Note that TCP has acts and data packets, right? So some packets are just pure acts. Uh, we don't have retransmission for them. These are the data that are transmitted. The segments out, the counterpart to that is also prefixed by data segs out because it is only the data segments out. It's, it doesn't account for acts, act packets that we send out. There's a DSAC dupes. Uh, if you're not familiar with du DSACs or duplicate SACs, when we retransmit something and the other side have already received that sequence, it would send us a DSAC so that the other side knows this was a spurious retransmission. For example, it has more aggressive, more than needed, more aggressive than needed RTO. Like you retransmitted something, but it wasn't actually lost. So we receive a DSAC for that, and you can use this to estimate the number of spurious retransmissions you have had on your connection. Um, this is very good to see if you're using a very uh, aggressive RTO or uh, somehow your receiver is just too slow to process the packets. Or someone has, has installed a QDisk on, on the ingress path of that, uh, of that box. There's also DSEXIN, which is uh, the data segments received by this connection. The last row are also very recent. Uh, this is TCP delivered. Um, it's basically the number of uh, like uh, packets you have um, delivered to the other side. It's sum of acts and sacked packet segments up to this point. And then there's delivered CE, which is the packets that were delivered but had an ECN mark, the like congestion event on them on the ACK. This way, you may not have lost, but if you're using DCTCP, you can see how, what fraction of your delivered bytes or packets to the other side had an ECN mark on them, so they, they, they experienced congestion. Um, these two are uh, important uh, recipes um, that come useful. If you want to see the, your TCP retransmission rate in person, just divide the total retrans by segs out. Those casts are not needed, but I casted them just to make sure um, it is clear. Um, 
if you want to know the actual loss rate of uh, that TCP measures for your connection, you have to deduct the DSACs from the number of retransmits because those were spuriously retransmitted. So it's not network's fault, it's just TCP retransmitting something that it shouldn't have retransmitted. Does make sense? Okay. So um, a huge chunk of TCP is basically congestion control. Um, the second field in the TCP info, if you look at it by order, uh, it's a CA state or congestion avoidance state. Um, they're like uh, open disorder, uh, recovery loss, CWR, you can, uh, they have different meanings for different congestion controls. So uh, if you're using Reno and Cubic, it might be useful. If you're using BBR, you have to be very careful about like how you interpret them. It's there, they have different meanings. Um, one thing that is uh, very useful to just read uh, sometimes from your connection is just the congestion window. This is the send side congestion window. It's not the receive uh, window. Uh, it's in terms of packets. Uh, and it can go up to U32. And we have, had, uh, we have had events that it actually reaches a very large number. So uh, it's very good to monitor this value to make sure your congestion control is doing the same thing. Uh, a slow start threshold uh, basically is the threshold of congestion window up to which we slow start for some congestion controls. For BBR, it has a very different meaning, for example. So this field also uh, should be, uh, sh sh you should actually use this when you're very familiar with the condition control you're using. Otherwise, um, it can be misleading. For example, s star threshold of Reno is very different than what you get from uh, BBR. TCP pacing rate. Um, I have a typo in my slide, sorry. So the other one is TCP max pacing rate. Uh, so TCP has a pacing rate of this connection. Uh, it is bytes per second, not bits per second. So always uh, times eight if you want to see the bits per second uh, rate. Um, and there's a max pacing rate for the connection which TCP would never go above this rate. So if you set the so max pacing rate socket option, you can uh, basically cap the, uh, the max pacing rate of your connection, that also is in bytes per second. And that is um, a source of errors um, if you're not familiar with the units. Uh, delivery rate um, is basically uh, from the building block of TCP BBR. So bottleneck bandwidth, the first part, is uh, basically max filtering the delivery rate of the connection. Uh, this delivery rate comes from that source. Basically, TCP is measuring the bytes delivered to the other side in bytes per second uh, using ACTS and SACTS. It's just an estimate. Um, and um, it is available for you to read on TCP info. It's basically the good put of your connection. However, there is a catch to this field. Uh, let's say I have a connection, a TCP connection and a 100 gig link. I send one byte per second. The throughput of the TCP connection cannot be higher than one byte per second because TCP doesn't generate bytes. It's the application that is generating the bytes. So the good put of TCP can never go higher than that, right? Or one byte divided by RTT, sorry. So uh, if your RTT is 100 millisecond, is one byte divided by 100 millisecond, but you could actually reach 100 gigabits per second. You actually don't know that. We have a bit in TCP that estimates if TCP could send something, but it was limited by the application backlog. So if, for example, my, I, I could send a, a, another TSO chunk, but I didn't have any data to send, I set this bit. And we call that app limited. So when this bit is set next to delivery rate, you shouldn't really use that delivery rate. You can't rely on this delivery rate. This is just a guesstimate of TCP's delivery rate. Uh, when Yu Chang added uh, TCP rate app limited to TCP info, I think two years, it was two years ago, um, we use the hole in TCP info, so it's fit in the top of the structure. Uh, but if you're using an old kernel that doesn't support this feature, that bit is not 
set or is uh, basically zero. So make sure you check the versioning because this is a hole. It's not as it's not appended. It's inserted in in this structure. TCP uh, TCP also has like two RTTs currently in the structure. Uh, one is smooth RTT. It's in USEC. A smooth RTT is the weighted average of RTT samples you get. Uh, it can be very, very misleading. Why? Because TCP delays acknowledgments. If you're on a ping pong traffic, you're always getting delayed acknowledgments and your SRTT can be bloated. So this is usually the upper bound on those, uh, upper bound of RTT on the connection. You can also see the RTT variance for, that is used for calculating smooth RTT as per RFC. There is another field in the structure that is added uh, after BBR, uh, which is min RTT. This is the min filtered RTT sample. Uh, it is not the minimum RTT used by BBR. It is RTT samples using another min filter. The length of that min filter is controlled by syscaddle. By default, it's set to five minutes. So if you want more like, recent RTT value in your TCP info, you have to change that syscaddle to use a shorter window. BBR has its own min filter length. It's very different than uh, what we have, what we provide in TCP info. But overall, this is um, a very useful field to have a lower bound of your RTT. Um, after Eric uh, changed the model to EDT, like earlier departure time, uh, presented by uh, Van in last NetDev, this mean RTT can have a slightly different measurement. Uh, before that, it could be, it, it, could, it, could, it would include QDIS delays. After that, uh, it sometimes doesn't have the QDIS delay. So it, it depends on the QDIS you use, I think. Uh, but uh, make sure, like, uh, depending on the version of the kernel, this value can include some overheads, uh, and in newer version, it would just exclude them. So the chronos. Um, I've been asked to explain this in more details because we added this to uh, kernel. It was a, a, one of our interns added this. Um, uh, this is uh, basically to uh, measure how long TCP was in a particular state. And it, it was very useful for us because uh, people can open TCP connections, don't use them for a, for a long time, or for some weird reason, TCP couldn't actually send anything. Uh, so we wanted to create a chrono that basically captures the time TCP spending doing something. The first time is busy, busy time. It's uh, the, the interval that TCP was busy sending something. Uh, it wasn't limited by anything. But when we hit the receive window, we stop the, the busy time chrono, if we were sending, and we start the RWIN, RWND limited or RWIN limited chrono. Basically, I am, from this point on, I'm limited for the other side to open its receive window for me. So it goes uh, until the receive window opens up. If I exit this point, now I'm busy sending. So the busy chrono start to be, yes, it starts to uh, uh, get incremented, and then the RBIN limited stops. Send buff limited is when the user was in send message context, and it had more payload to send, but send buff wasn't open. So we uh, start the chrono, say, user actually could send something but we are basically limited by send buff. We couldn't accept their, the bytes they wanted to send. So this is another chrono. And these are prioritized when we are in send buff limited. We are not, uh, if we are in receiving the limited, I think we increment that one first, then send buff, and then busy time. So. Uh, and this is by well, Questions? We can do it now if you want. Sure, we can do interactive. A very quick clarification question. Sure. The previous slide, you had delivery date uh, and application limited. Now, presumably app limited is, is constantly changing. Right. Um, so is delivery rate uh, an instantaneous value? And app limited and delivery rate, are they both instantaneous values? That's a very good question. Um, 
and it's actually the source of confusion when using TCP info. When you call TCP info, we uh, look into the socket. If the last delivery rate sample wasn't app limited, it's the instantaneous delivery rate. If it is app limited, it is the last non app limited delivery rate on that socket. So what that or or the last delivery rate sample. So the the idea is our last accurate estimate on this connection is when we weren't app limited. So let's give that to the user and also tell them that I am app limited. I can't tell you the actual estimate. I see. So the app limited flag is not something that I should check to see if the delivery rate is valid or not because the delivery rate will always be valid. But it might be very stable. It very might be old. old. Yeah. You were slow starting. It might be very Got actually it. very smaller than the, your current current app one. Rate. Even, even if, even if it's app limited. Yes. I see. Understood. Understood. Okay. Thank you. For example, the sun buff can be 10 meg. Yeah. I have one meg. I'm app limited, but it's still a lot of data to send. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Sure. So, I had a couple of questions about the uh, CA state. Is there any documentation on what these states mean? Because I was trying to figure it out, and you have to read the code, and it's not necessary. You might be misunderstanding the code. Uh, that's a good. Uh, Eric might know. I don't know if there's. I think it's just an enumeration. Yeah. Because like disorder, last recovery start, CCF, CW, all of them yeah. seem to mean this almost the same thing. It would be good if there was documented somewhere, so at least in a comment in the code or something. I think there's no API. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. So, so, so the reason I was looking at this is trying to figure out when mm -hmm. last recovery starts, and when it ends. And even if you poll, it's you. It's easy to misinterpret these these states and go the wrong way. So, yeah, especially with TLD drops and all things, it's the states are. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll pass the mic. Anybody else? It's, it's please speak on the mic so we can. Eric, maybe we'll leave the mic there with you. Can we have the slides back on, please? Thank you. All right. Uh, so these are the TCP kernels. Note that these are cumulative counters. So if you get it at time t, the delta at time t2 has to be calculated based on cumulative uh, values. There's another catch here. These are in USEC units. We actually sent the RFC patch with USEC uh, resolution. But we need a 64, 364 bits. Uh, the feedback was make them 32 bits, store them in, in milliseconds. So the resolution is actually milliseconds, but because we wanted to make sure the API, later if we decide to use USEC, the API doesn't have, because we can't really change the definitions on if it is in TCP info, it's just done. So they are exported as USEC, but the resolution of the actual chrono in implementation currently is milliseconds. Is a Jiffy. Jiffy, yes. Sorry, yeah, I should say Jiffy. It's 32 bits. So, um, caveats. Uh, you, we cannot uh, remove fields from TCP info. Why? Because fields in TCP info is part of the public API. If I remove a field and a user space program access that field, that, field, that, that program wouldn't compile. So we can't really remove any field. So there are deprecated fields in that structure that are not set on newer kernel, but they are just there. So you can always uh, read zero. Uh, a most notable example is TCP facet. When uh, we replace fac with rack and just remove fac every forward acknowledgement uh, from TCP, uh, we, we just don't send packets, but it's still there. And we always have to copy. So this is one caveat. You always uh, pay for the memory bandwidth of um, of the uh, of setting these fields. TCP info, don't try to get it every nanosecond on your, every microseconds on your machine. It has a very very high overhead, especially if you are in a high performance NIC. The reason is that we have to grab the socket lock. It, it didn't have to used to do this. Um, currently, except for listening sockets. We grabbed the log. Eric did that because there was a very important catch here. We were updating retransmission after the byte sent. User always assume the number of packets through send is always larger than retransmission. But we were reading the field after packet send, and user were complaining, 
oh, why is it larger? And it was actually very dangerous because they were, these are unsigned fields. The delta overflows ridiculously large numbers that that doesn't make sense. So we grab the lock, we unlock it. Don't try to use this like every send message or every receive message, it's just costly. Um, and the other overhead that TCP info has is just a large block of memory. Sometimes you just need the minimum RTT, but you have to read a lot of data from the kernel. As I said, there are two set rights here, one for the kernel to fill in the TCP info fields and one for us to copy to user space. So it's a very memory bandwidth intensive call uh, for a socket option, not for uh, IO. Um, and it doesn't really include everything. For example, if you want to know the congestion control of your TCP, you should use the TCP congestion socket option. If you want to know the parameters of your congestion control algorithm, you should use CC info or congestion control info, which has the netlink attribute of the parameters, say for BBR or for uh, cubic. If you want to know the write mem, read mem, OMEM, the maximum value, you should use mem info. These are not available in TCP info. Um, there were other fields in the structure. I think I, I'm already almost out of time. So uh, I didn't go through all of them, but uh, if you had any questions. We, we discussed to <laughs> create a man entry for TCP info after uh, this all time. There is basically no documentation, not in the source code nor a man page. So we're hopefully going to document all the fields. Now, uh, the next thing that I want to cover is TCP. So timestamping, I should acknowledge that Willem uh, de Bruggen is uh, the person who added, uh, de Bruggen uh, is the person who added the uh, so timestamping support to TCP. So what I'm presenting here is mostly his contributions. Uh, so timestamping for TCP provides three a main, a four main timestamps for you. One is called a scheduled, um, basically when your packet enters QDIS. It's, I think, in DevQXMIT, so for, uh, you, you get the a scheduled timestamp there. Then you have the transmit timestamp, hardware or software. On older kernel, these are mutually exclusive. On newer kernel, uh, I think that a new feature was added so that you can get both hardware and software timestamp for a transmit for a transmission of a packet. On the receive side, you can get the receive timestamp for hardware or software. I think they're still mutually exclusive, um, but I'm not sure. I have to check this one. Uh, and uh, the last timestamp is the acknowledge timestamp when the acknowledgement for a byte was received by the sender. Each of these timestamps, uh, after I think 4.10, have uh, opstats attached to them. Why do we have this? Let's say you receive a scheduled timestamp from the kernel. This, when you read it, when your user space reads this from uh, the socket, it might be minutes or seconds, uh, a long period after the time has happened because your user space thread can get this schedule. It just may not get scheduled to run. And at that time, if you call TCP info to see why TCP is not sending fast enough, your TCP info is not for the time that you have actually sent the packet, right? You want the state of TCP at the time an event has occurred, not at the time you're reading that event or seeing that event, because you're just too slow. Uh, no offense to user space. Um, so opstats are basically TCP info attached to your timestamps. You enable that, and then on your timestamp, you get your congestion window, RTT, delivery rate, loss rate, byte sent, uh, all the chronos. Actually, we added this. First, the first version only had the chronos, because those, with using those chronos, you can you can reason a lot about the lifetime of your of the packet in TCP. And then we gradually added everything. We are in lessons learned based on the rigid structure of TCP info. These are all netlink attributes. They're harder to read, but it gives us the like we can just customize what we want to send. We can remove things. We can deprecate them. So it's much easier for us to maintain. 
there are there there is a main uh, there is a major difference between receive and send timestamps. Overall, between anything you do in send and anything you do in receive, or have this inherent uh, lim uh, difference. Uh, when you are receiving a packet on receive message, I'm reading something from the socket. Everything kernel wants to do with that packet is already done. It knows the timestamps. It knows when it is received. It knows how many bytes there are. Whatever, it's just there. So it gives you those timestamps via a C message and your receive message. On transmit, it's much more different. You send the packet, TCP may decide to send it a minute later. So you cannot have a C message piggyback it to the user space. You have to have an asynchronous mechanism to send these timestamps to user space. That's where error queue comes in play. So in, uh, in Linux, there is the actual queue, like your data queue, and there is error queue, which was used to send, uh, receive the ICMP errors of that, uh, on that connection. This is how traceroute is implemented. So you read your ICMP packets whenever they are received on this side. Okay? Uh, we use the same error queue as a control channel now. So zero copy, transmit time stamping, everything. Anything that is has to be asynchronously sent to the user space is sent via epolar. Um, this is one example. I'm running out of time. Do you want me to? Okay. So this is one example. Let's say you receive an, uh, uh, you call your send message and sometime, 29 microseconds after this, TCP sends it out to the QDisk. So packet is there. And it takes about 11 milliseconds to send this packet. This is from production traffic. It actually sends the packet out after 11 milliseconds. Why that happens? It basically means something throttled your packet. I installed an HDB on my machine to generate these timestamps. So you, just looking at these numbers, you can say the main bottleneck is between key, entering QDisk and giving it to the driver, the device in the driver. So I'm basically spending most of my time inside the QDisk. Um, there are many more examples. Um, I have another talk that goes into the detail of like how to interpret these timestamps and. Uh, more examples on uh, from production. And as you can see, you always receive the opt stats next to these timestamps. So you can, for example, see the RTT of the network is about 110 microseconds. So this 11 milliseconds is like two orders of magnitude uh, longer delay than the actual physical network. So um, caveats, current timestamps have their own overhead. If you enable it on 100% of uh, packets, I've done this. It's 20% uh, regression on high-speed network, give or take. Um, if you want to use it in production, make sure you uh, use C messages to have accurate sample. Like I just sample a few of your send messages, and then come up with the proper sampling rate uh, empirically. Just deploy it, and then try to see for your workload, which uh, sampling rate makes sense. Prior to 4.10, you basically shouldn't use timestamps. Uh, it pauses your IO. Uh, whenever we enqueue something ICMP on an error queue, we set the SK error of the socket. For timestamps, when we enqueued them, we wouldn't say set SK error. But when we dequeued them, we would set the SK error to the next timestamp on that socket. And when SK error is set, TCP send message and receive message would return with an error. And if you know the error number, you can handle that, but it basically pauses your IO. Uh, so make sure you have this, the, uh, you're, you're using it after 4.10. It was the smallest patch we sent upstream was removing one line. It broke traceroute and ping the day after. So it wasn't easy to do, and then we did a lot of workarounds with Eric's help. Um, and uh, so there's no bug reported as far as I know, and it's uh, very stable to use now with pretty good performance. Your, your IO aren't going to be paused. This is exactly the same reason in uh, zero copy, TCP zero copy, Willem used an error code of zero. So before this patch, zero would be set on SK error so that your IO is not paused. So these two mechanisms are both very useful. With opstats, you basically have TCP info and timestamping. 
if you want to have a summarized view of your TCP state, TCP info is great. Um, it's very easy to use. Uh, it's just one Cisco. Uh, TCP timestamping is much more difficult to use. You have to handle errors, uh, read the error queue, understand timestamps. Uh, but they provide more functionalities, especially if you want to debug application performance. Like why this HTTP2 frame was delivered out at this time. Why this particular gRPC RPC is slow. For those, you really need to know the timestamp. You can't just look at TCP and say, oh, I, I see this pack, there was a pre-transmission during uh, when I was sending this RPC. Unless you're Eric, he looks at TCP info and debugs RPC forever. <laughs> so uh, moving forward, um, these two things are both very rigid. They're like timestamps are a limited set of events. Uh, and you can't really customize them. There should be a new kernel version for the, like if you should be go to NetNext if you want to uh, introduce a new timestamping. It's, it's very uh, rigid and you can't easily customize that. Uh, eBPF provides a um, great uh, opportunity here, I think, if we can provide the same functionalities using them. Larry has a great talk uh, and he's working on like TCP eBPF that provides many of these functionalities in eBPF. And thank you. Any questions? So I guess these options require applications to be changed, right? Can we uh, use these? You mean so timestamping? You mean so timestamping? Yeah, so timestamping or so TCP info. Yes, they, they, they both need application applications. So we cannot use running applications. So well, then TCP info is also provided by SS. So if you SS on your machine, it's uh, get from, you can see the same values uh, that are available in TCP info. Mm -hmm. You don't really need to. You don't need to own the socket. Yeah. Somebody oh. has to manage the socket. But for timestamping, you have to modify your application. Okay. It has to be instructed to the kernel that this socket needs these timestamps, otherwise it wouldn't be generated. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can grab this, we, all, of the, all of the points that we capture timestamps have probes, so you can do like BCC offload to them and capture the same timestamps, but they are different mechanism, they're not so timestamping. Mm -hmm. oh, another thing about the timestamping, when you are sending, uh, suppose a send message can send uh, can result in multiple packets, right? right? How do we get the information about that? Uh, That's a great question. I I'll go into more details in the talk, but basically the timestamping captures one timestamp per send message. For UDP, that makes sense, it's one packet. Mm -hmm. For TCP, it is the last byte of that send message. Oh. And, um, but you can, you can do creative stuff, like uh, there's EOR added to TCP, so you can, like say, one MTU size send message with an EOR and then your rest of uh, bytes. So you, you basically capture timestamp for a specific packet if you want. Um, but you have to, for if you just want uh, your normal send message to capture uh, timestamping without any modification, it would be the last byte. Um, a quick question on the on the errors that you talked about with SO timestamping. Can you very briefly say what the errors are that you have to deal with as an application from SO timestamping? You mentioned that it's it's that there are some errors that you have to deal with, or maybe I misheard what you said. You mean uh, when we were uh, doing uh, SKB, we were selecting SK error? Or? No, not before four ten. Oh. If I'm going to use SO timestamping right now, do I have to deal with any errors? <laughs> Oh, um, you have to deal with error queue, not errors. Uh, I see. But um, timestamps are socket extended errors, so they have their own error code. They're not errors, but they have eno message error code. I see. And that is what this you can distinguish this with, like ICMP errors on your on your uh, error queue. They're not really errors you need to deal with. It's just they have error codes. They look like errors, but they are timestamps. Understood. Okay. It's a Thank control you. channel, but we are still using the same API. Yeah, yeah, I get that. 
so because you said that the opt stats are captured with the timestamps, uh, how many such statistics are stored in memory? Is, there, is that historical information? Like the error queue would have a set of, I'm assuming, timestamps that you can retrieve. Are you storing all those stats for every event? For every event? Uh, so that's a great question. The timestamps are accounted for your RMEM. So uh, up until you fill the RMEM, we just enqueue timestamps. And for all of them, we attach everything. Okay, so if the user space is delayed in querying, you just keep on accumulating yeah. the statistics. And they're captured at the time we are, so before adding them to the error queue, we capture TCP state, attach it to the timestamp, put them on the error queue. User can read it a minute, or even when the connection is closed. They don't have to read it now. Okay, uh, a follow-up question. So the 20% uh, overhead that you said for timestamping, similarly you said TCP info al also has overhead. Uh, do you have any idea of like how much that overhead is left if let's say the application queries every one millisecond? Is that even noticeable? Every one millisecond uh, depends on the number of connections. It's just one connection that uh, I I wouldn't do that on a 100 gig link, for example. But if it's like a, a RAN link, internet facing, that would be completely fine. It really depends on the workload. So when you hold a log for a few mac or even one microsecond. Uh, that would cause enough harm for a 100 gig connection because of the gap in the ACK stream. But if you have a 200 millisecond RTT, it just doesn't matter. Okay, got it, thank you. Yeah. Oh, another thing that I forgot, um, whenever we have something on the error queue, ePoll error would be fired. So if you keep them there and never read anything, there are errors, so ePoll error is there. And ePoll error has this quirk that it's always set you don't, you don't have to ask for it. It's always given to you. So it's like you're just waking up a full error properly. So you can, you, know, you have to be very careful if you want to delay reading timestamps. So when you're doing a T TSO offload um, using a NIC, and uh, you said the, the timestamp is for the last byte of the whole packet and say you have an EDT offload, um, how do you paste the segments within the TSO? The segments within the TSO? I don't think <coughs> if you're pasting paces within TSO. <coughs> yeah, the TCP stack doesn't paste per packet. So you will see, you will see bursts uh, with TSO? Yes. You will see the one timestamp for the last byte of the TSO chunk if it is the last byte. And if you coalesce multiple packets into the same TSO, uh, you'll get one timestamp for all of those coalesced packets. I think you don't want to paste your answers out of one TSO packet, otherwise yeah. the, the receiver side won't communicate the application from the zero, uh, the error side. So you better want to have burst, but you need to control the burst side to avoid it. So just to repeat what Eric said for the mic, and uh, you don't want to paste TSO chunks because on the other side, it would just kill GRO. You want to burst them out so that you get a one large GRO on the other side and it goes up. Was that a correct? Okay. <laughs> Jamal asked me, so. <laughs> Hello, uh, quick question. So first, thanks for the talk. Uh, TCP info is indeed pretty poorly documented. Um, the question is about uh, RTT. You mentioned that RTT and TCP info has some caveats. Uh, I kind of got what you tried to say, but is there anything else? Because uh, sure. So uh, the 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 thing is, what TCP measures at RTT is as good as the delays you're introducing on the end hosts. So, for example, if I send you the packet. You just don't send me an ACK for one second. Even if my RTT is 20 macros, TCP's view of RTT is going to be 10 microsecond plus one second of your delay, right? So whatever your, the receiver delay is, that is accumulated in the RTT samples in TCP because TCP doesn't have any other signal, right? So it means that the RTT will have reasonable value at the start of the con connection after the handshake, and then it can go berserk. No, CNAC RTT can be more accurate, but it really depends. So um, if your uh, receiver is just busy, 
it wouldn't, if, even for CNAC, sending the CNAC, it would take a long time for that. So we, we have like situations in prod that RTT just bounces up because one end host, like it was a faulty hardware or was just too busy. It couldn't do anything on, it was just stressed. Uh, so yeah, that, that's a quirk of TCP RTT. You have to be, it's not really NIC to NIC RTT. It's end host, it's TCP to TCP RTT, if you will. start. Hi, my name is Chris Rapier. I'm with the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We're associated with Carnegie Mellon University. We are a, I am specifically in the network research section of PSC, but because of the way that funding works, I work all over the entire center, everywhere from file systems to storage arrays to production to research. Um, let's give you a bit of background on that. Let's see. All right. So what I'm here to talk to you about today is um, our implementation of RFC 4898. Now, RFC 4898 is a <coughs> MIB of around 120 different TCP instruments that was published uh, around 12 years ago by Matt Mathis, uh, who's currently at Google. Um, this provides a superset of instrumentations that are not found in TCP info. And at the time that we were developing this, TCP info was a relatively bare set of instrumentations within the kernel. And we thought it would be good to have more of an insight into what we considered to be the black box of the TCP stack. Um, now, these instruments that we have, we have them grouped into various number of classifications. Uh, these deal with stack, uh, which would be options, state, dupax and congestion avoidance events, things like that. Then we have our path metrics, RTT, RTO, dupax, out. Application metrics. Now, we found the application metrics to be very important. These would be um, send unacknowledged, uh, send max, uh, the number of octets act, both at 32 and 64 bit. Um, things dealing with the application queues so that we can get some information about how the application is interacting with the stack. Uh, we have the performance stack, which would be um, segments and octets in and out. And then unlike TCP info, we actually have three instruments that we actually have write access to. Uh, these write access <coughs> instruments allow us to actually tune the performance characteristics of the stack. Um, Specifically, uh, the receive window. The receive window is one of the things that actually allows you to able to do the um, receive window auto tuning, and that came out of a previous incarnation of RFC 4898 work called Web 100. Um, three implementations of RFC 4898 currently exist. Uh, we have Web 100, which was it's quite old now. Um, and, and that is defunct, and that was Linux-based. We have Web10G, which is what I'm here to talk to you about. It's currently active, and shockingly enough, it also exists inside of the Microsoft TCP stack as the TCP eStats instrumentation uh, structure. Some of these RFC 4898 instruments have been incorporated into the TCP info stack. The last time I checked, uh, just looking at the comments, there were around nine of these instruments that were included in the TCP info stack. Now, tell you a little bit about Web10G. Um, <clears throat> this is implemented as a set of patches to the Linux kernel. And this set of patches actually provide the base instrumentation as, as is required. There is also a set of memory structures that we store the information and in. we do not store the information directly in the socket. We actually store it in a hash of memory structs. Each memory struct is instantiated every time a new socket is created and entered into the hash. Uh, we're using UT hash for that. Um, we have 
a way of enabling that through a uh, kernel parameters. We enable it through the TCP um, eStats parameter. One of the things that we also have in this is we have a persistence timer. Now the persistence timer is actually important for what we do, which on the research side. The persistence timer allows this memory struct that we created on the hash to exist beyond the close of the socket so that we can get after the close of the socket, we can actually get final data out of the socket. Um, the access is provided via Netlink via kernel module, uh, dynamically loadable kernel module. The module call, the module draws both from TCP uh, eStats and TCP info as appropriate. We're not doubling up the number of instruments in there. If TCP info has something that's important that we're calling in RFC 4898, then we just grab it from there as opposed to doubling up. Uh, finally, we have a user land API that's built around libmnl. Uh, that allows us to get the information directly out of the kernel via netlink into user land so we can do something productive with it. Uh, we have multiple examples and utilities that are provided in the user land library. Um, these allow you to directly access uh, all of the information provided by TCP info and uh, TCP eStats. Um, and you can, one of the interesting things about it is that you can actually um, get information on any application that's running where you have rights to that socket um, without actually changing the, without actually changing the code base for that application. So that if we can actually basically provide instrumentation for any network application uh, without providing any modifications. Um, now for anyone who's actually has any experience previously with Web 10G, uh, I presented on this <coughs> four years ago at NetDev 15. Um, we have actually done some modifications to it. We have removed all of the externs that were associated with it and are using the uh, um, new structures to allow for to pass kernel options forward. We have been forward porting this every time that we've had a new kernel revision come out. We're currently at 419. We have not yet forward ported to 50 yet. Um, we are working on incorporating the instrumentation that TCP provides for BBR. And we're also doing some work on actually improving the performance handling of this um, as mostly in terms of creating the memory structures associated with the hash so that we can uh, decrease some of the overhead associated with that. Now, one of the things that I have been told is as an academic, we just like to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. We don't really think about what's going in there. We just you know, hey, let's just throw 120 instruments into the stack and see what happens. Um, this is entirely true. This is what we do. Um, there's funding reasons for that, but basically because we have a limited amount of funding, we want to get as much done in that funding period as possible, and then we let everyone else figure out what the hell we've done. But the question is, now that we have everything thrown at the wall, what can we do about seeing what sticks? Um, well, we actually feel that Web10G has value in terms of TCP analytics outside of the boundaries provided by TCP info. Um, Web10G in and of itself um, is a really good way of getting real world detailed flow metrics. Uh, one of the major advantages of it that we have is that we have an entire uh, ecosystem based around Web10G that can provide you with detailed metrics of any running network application. Um, now this is a sampled data. I mean, it's not gonna replace a TCP dump, but it can provide you pretty, high, pretty decently high resolution in terms of flow evolution. Um, for example, one of the items that we have is we have what's called Web10G Logger. This actually reports uh, TCP info, TCP eStats information on every single application running on that uh, system, network application. And we can do that at its user-defined sample rate. The default is every second, but we can do that every millisecond. Um, 
every millisecond is going to destroy your performance. Um, but if you only have one or two um, applications on there that you're really interested in, we can still actually provide some very good information on how that TCP flow is evolving over time. Um, now, we do have some experience with how, with how this has been used in research application settings. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Teacup out of Swinburne in Australia. Um, Teacup, I don't think it exists anymore. I think it got incorporated into another organization at Swinburne. But it was actually making significant use of Web10G in their uh, research infrastructure. Uh, specifically in terms of flow evolution, trying to determine uh, how flows interact in real world settings. Um, now, not everyone who uses Web10G tells me that they're using it because they just don't. But uh, a review on uh, various uh, citations, information, and things like that. We have been finding that it has been used in a number of different ways in terms of published papers from academic research, research institutions exploring buffer bloat, um, cloud performance, wireless issues. Um, they've also been using it, interestingly enough, in network modeling reproduci reproducibility. Um, basically using Web10G to determine if their network model actually is reproducible in the real world. And that was actually a unique application that I never thought of doing before, but it's kind of cool that someone's actually using this in a way I haven't thought of. Uh, and if any of you are familiar with the measurement lab, um, this is also one of the foundations. RSE 4898 is one of the foundations for the publicly available data sets at measurement lab, specifically the MDT, Network Diagnostic Toolkit. Um, the data that's coming out of there. And this, these data sets have been proven to be very useful in terms of people trying to do uh, research into flow evolution and the um, analysis, automated analysis of network pathologies. Um, now, the automated analysis of network pathologies is kind of my thing, so I'm really excited to see that people are doing that. Um, now, there are a number of different ways in which you might think about deploying Web10G and why you want to deploy it. Um, I think the thing is in this, you don't really want to do this in a high-scale production network. Um, the, as previously mentioned, it's expensive. Um, I didn't know about the socket being locked down with the newer versions of the kernel, and that's, yeah, that's a problem. Um, and one of the other things that we find is that just the process of actually creating the sockets, of creating the memory structs, has a negative impact on socket creation. So what ends up happening is the time to create the socket is actually delayed by the creation of the external memory structure. And this is an impact, this is a negative impact in places where you're dealing with, you know, hundreds of thousands or even tens of thousands of concurrent connections. So where you would want to deploy this is um, where you're dealing with lower, uh, lower volume servers, specifically in terms of what we call data transfer nodes or DTNs. Uh, we use these specifically in the research community on these things called science DMZs. These are how we transfer the large data sets that we're using from the uh, data collection areas to the compute resources where we analyze the data. And these can be data sets anywhere from, you know, several hundred gigabytes to tens of terabytes. Um, but actually having information on how those flows evolve over time is actually really important in terms of determining when we're coming across pathological conditions that either lead to uh, transfer failures or suboptimal transfers. Um, and one of the things that's important is when we're transferring, you know, a couple terabytes, even if we're running at 80% below, even if we're running just 20% below where we should be on that flow, 
that can actually um, add another 10, 12 hours onto our transfer time, which significantly impacts the workflow that we're trying to deal with. Um, again, we're only doing sampling with this, but your sample rate is up to you. Um, one of the things we have found, it's even though it's sampling, we're accurate at line rate. So we can get data out regardless of what your line rate is because as long as the kernel can keep up with what's going on, we can get the data out of there. Um, this is the same, in, the same caveats apply to this as would apply to polling TCP info because we are polling TCP info in this process as well. Now, <clears throat> One of the main reasons why they had me come here is to talk about uh, one of our applications of this, of Web10G in a production environment. Uh, this, is a, um, this is an application called Excite. Excite was a uh, program sponsored by the NSF under their Eager program, which is for high risk, high return um, ideas. And the idea behind Excite is a distributed flow data collection and analysis platform powered by Web10G. The goal of it is really to identify failing flows, automatically identify failing flows within the lifetime of that flow so that we can apply, um, we can either apply corrective measures during the lifespan of that flow or we can actually identify uh, persistent pathologies within our network. Uh, these persistent pathologies might be anything from the infrastructure level, buffer bloat, poorly configured switches, middle boxes, or it could be application level issues, such as with one of the main things that we use for uh, transferring data is a application called Grid FTP, uh, which comes out of Globus. Um, <coughs> the other idea behind it as a distributed net, as a distributed network monitoring system is it gives us what, what I like to call a panoptical view of the network. For every place where we have one of these, um, I'll get to that, the, the structure in a moment, for every place where we have an instrumented data transfer node, we can actually draw that information to a centralized storage location run reports and analysis on it and provide network operators a view of not just how their network is working in an aggregate like we might get with a uh, network weather monitoring service, but on a per flow basis. Um, we find this to be very important because one of the things that we find is that if we're just doing bandwidth monitoring or if we're just doing uh, per sonar tests, or if we're just looking at um, you know, some of the various uh, you know, errors on the network that we're seeing at uh, the switches, we can actually miss important information that is happening. We can say like, oh, the bandwidth is great because you know, we're seeing 75% you know, utilization across this link, but what we're missing is that it's one flow that's clobbering every other flow and we don't have that information without getting this more detailed flow-based analysis. Um, now, Epside is set up as a set of three independent agents. The first are the listeners. Now, the listeners live on Web10G enabled um, DTNs that live within the science DMZs. Web10G is a series of kernel patches, so of course we have to have custom kernels on here. Yes, yes, I move very quickly at this point. Um, we do policy-based sampling, uh, filtering, duration, things like that. So what we can do is uh, we only want to look at flows that are originating from one specific subnet that are only using a specific application, in this case, grid FTP, and the flow has to last longer than 30 seconds before we start collecting data on it and incorporating that into our database. Um, Minimal overhead on these. Uh, we're seeing less than 2% usage of the CPU on most of our DTNs. Um, it's multi threaded to have in the interactions within um, the listeners are multi threaded, so we can actually fire off trace routes so that 
as we get the flow, not only do we have the flow, we can also get uh, the trace route to and from the origin. Um, let's see, moving quickly. We have a centralized storage engine. This is actually a time series database. We're using influx, influx DB for this because someone told us it was the right thing to do. Um, so far, it's working well for us. Then we have an analysis engine. The analysis engine trawls through the information that we capture in InfluxDB and provides some, at this point, rudimentary level analysis on it. Um, we do hope to work on that in the future. Uh, currently, just over the past seven months, we just deployed a new schema. Um, on two DTNs, we had 368,000 flows that we've monitored. All of these flows have existed longer than 30 seconds. We've captured close to 7 million data points. Um, one of the big things that we learned is schema is really important because if we have too high of a level of cardinality on the data, it makes it impossible to do reads on it. Status. No bucks, no buck rogers. Uh, proposals have been submitted to the NSF to expand on this both in, in 2017 and 2018. Both were unfortunately declined because we have not shown that the research is valid before they gave us money to do the research to see if it was valid. That's how the NSF works. Uh, however, the process of developing these proposals has provided us a good roadmap for future work, and if anyone has a couple hundred thousand dollars they'd like to give us, we can do some great work with it. Um, we've developed a better deployment model. Uh, we have incorporated work um, for machine learning analysis with this. Um, <coughs> one of the things that we're actually looking at doing is causal discovery algorithms to establish whether or not the instruments we're collecting actually mean anything. Um, that's part of seeing what sticks. Um, one of the ideas that we'd like to do is actually pare down the instruments set to just the things that are most important for determining flow uh, flow health. We're also looking at, this is the moonshot here, is some, doing some predictive models, seeing if we can determine based on initial, initial conditions, the TCP options, and temporal variables, whether or not we can make any predictions about the health of the flow over the long term. This does just sound like AI sauce, and because we just throw AI on everything to see whether or not we get something out of it, but um, our collaborator is basically an AI expert at CMU. He thinks that there's some value with this based on previous work that he's done. Uh, we'll sub be submitting again in 2019, if we can, because I love writing proposals. Currently, Xsite is being maintained as much as I can because I have no money on it, and I'm the last man standing on this project as well. Useful URLs, please take a note. If you have any questions, I didn't have a lot of time here, please come up and talk to me. I'll answer your questions as best I can. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I think it's time for a break. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Larry Brackmo, Lawrence Brackmo. I'm from Facebook. And I'm going to be talking about TCP BPF and the latest updates and plans for TCP BPF related to uh, TCP analytics. Okay, so the initial focus for TCP BPF was on uh, optimization of TCP parameters. So for example, if we know a connection is uh, within the data center, we can optimize it by uh, tuning its parameters, having small buffers, small CNRTO, uh, clamping the congestion window, because we know that we do not need a congestion window of 700 within a data center to full fully utilize the, the bandwidth, right? And similarly, if the connection is going uh, between regions, we can also optimize by having larger buffers, larger initial connection window, a larger receive window. Uh, lately, we're also starting to focus on TCP analytics, uh, you know, things so that we can uh, gather good information on what's hurting our throughput. Uh, so for example, we have callbacks for retransmissions. Every time we have a retransmission, we can have a callback. Every time we have an RTO, when the TCP changes uh, state, we can also have a, uh, 
an event, we can have a callback, and then we can lag some information or try to catch some corner conditions. And lately, we some, someone added perf event notification support so that we can use the perf queue to uh, share information with user space. And for those who are not very familiar with TCP VPF, let me just give you a quick overview. Uh, so TCP VPF is a new type of VPF program. So VPF is that wonderful tool or extended VPF that allow us to uh, compile programs that run in kernel space. Right? But unlike uh, modules, uh, kernel modules, these are safe. They cannot crash the kernel. Right? We can hurt uh, things that we're controlling, like a connection. You know, if we change the buffer space and we make it too small, we're going to limit it, but we cannot hurt the system. Only the things that we, we are given permission to modify. And normally, VPF programs are, they have a call point at one place in the network stack. So they, when they're called, you always know it's being called from this particular point. Uh, TCP VPF is different in that it gets called back from many places within the TCP code. And then we use an, uh, an up field to tell us what happened, you know, where we're being called from. Sometimes it's being called so that we can return a, a particular value to the TCP stack. For example, the initial timeout that is used for CNRTOs, uh, the receive window we want to use, whether we need to use ECN for the congestion control or not, the uh, base RTT. Or you can also specify that just the place where we're being called from. For example, uh, when the connection, when we do a connect callback, and that's a good place to set, send and receive buffer sizes, for example. Or when the connection is being established, either active or passive. And those are also good places to do certain things like some buffer sizes, congestion control algorithm, et cetera. And the idea here was that we wanted to limit the number of callbacks. So initially, most of those are done when the connection is being established. So as not to hurt performance. Okay. Later on, like I mentioned, we added callback for every time we retransmit a packet, which again should be a rare event in general. We should not be retransmitting all the time. Uh, and within the TCP VPF program, we have access uh, to a lot of the TCP SAC fields. And they, they can just be, in, it's just a read. There's a, no overhead whatsoever. We want to get a particular field, like send congestion windows, send as a threshold, the RTT, it's just a read. No more overhead than that. Uh, we can also access the congestion control through a helper function called VPF gets a caption. And the reason is that the, you know, it returns a string, so it's just not a, a simple field read. And we also have a support for another helper function, VPF set socket option, to change some of the fields where we need to do some checking. And like I mentioned before, one of the guidelines is that a VPF program cannot hurt the kernel, right? So you cannot, we are not allowed to change a particular field such that we give it a value that could cause problems, like send congestion window, for example. If we set a value of zero, that would cause really, really bad behaviors in the kernel and it can crash it. Uh, so things like that, we use a helper function that will check whether the parameter we're trying to write is valid or not. Okay, so now going back to the updates. Uh, so are there any other questions about what TCP VPF is or, or not? Oh, okay, perfect. So there are some plans for this coming uh, half to add new callbacks. And some of those may be, we're gonna get some pushback from Eric probably, there he is, I knew it. Uh, so one is when a packet is sent or received, right? Once again, we're gonna use a bit flag so that the overhead is only to check this bit flag. Uh, and the idea is that we would not enable follow all flows because there's too much overhead, but only do it as needed. So for example, we can pick one 10,000 uh, flow, and for that flow, we may we want to uh, get the callback to get more information about that particular flow. Also, we may only want to turn it on 
when things start going south, you know, we're seeing problems. For example, we have too many retransmits or too many RPOs, right? So since we already have call us for those, it was starting seeing a level that is way too high, <coughs> could be based on averages or standard deviations of every other flow going to, for example, the same net. Uh, it could enable finer tracking, you know, like per packet to get more insight of what's going on. Uh, or also, you know, another way would be to trigger it externally. And this is something that we do not support right now, but we want to add so that we could say, we could know that one flow is behaving atypically. Something is wrong, the bandwidth is, the rate is very low. We don't know why, you know, we can do some pickup captures. We could also turn on the, uh, the bit so that we can capture per, per packet and to look at more information when we know that this flow is behaving abnormally. And why not be PPF K flows? Well, because those are called all the time, right? And yes, once you get called, you can decide not to do anything for that flow, but you get called all the time. Whereas with the other one, you know, the overhead of the bit flag, flag we can control better for which connections we want to do it. And in some ways, it's the idea that the selection is only done once, uh, not per packet, but you know, we do it once. Uh, so I mentioned this external trigger. And the idea, once again, is that we want to be able to, you know, like, I think we all experience this, that one of, well, one of the flows, well, one of the connections is behaving very abnormally, and then we try to figure out what's going on, right? We can do the TCP info, you know, to try to see what we see from there. This would be another mechanism where we can enable finite grain callbacks for TCP BPF. Uh, and the idea is that externally, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we would trigger the callback for a TCP program. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I could trigger the callback for, uh, <coughs> for TCP BPF. Uh, and then that program could do things like enable the bit so that we, we could uh, get callbacks for every packet we send or every packet we receive or anything else. So for example, for me, I tend to play a lot with congestion controls. And we the mechanism we have right now in TCP BPF to set congestion control is when the connection is established. But if something goes wrong for the existing flows, we don't have a good way to go back. This way we could trigger a callback into TCP BPF and the TCP BPF program for this particular upfield would say, okay, fall back into cubic, for example, uh, because things are behaving very badly. Uh, so, in terms of implementing this idea, uh, one way to do it would be similar to how we get TCP info, uh, where we would call it for all of the TCP flows. We need to grab the uh, socket lock, but we would call it for all existing flows. And, you know, the same way that it's done with SS, we could have a filter uh, to select the connect, the, which connection we want to call the program. And then the BPF program itself can also do its own filtering to decide even with more gr finer granularity for which flows to do something. Okay. Uh, it is expensive, but it's probably not something we would run very often. This is like uh, the congestion control we're playing with is creating havoc, so we want to fall back quickly, or because a connection is behaving very badly and we want to figure out what's going on. So it should be a rare occurrence. It's not something that we run every you know, a few times a second to collect statistics, but just to, you know, to, to investigate a particular occurrence. So typically it would be driven more by a human being, so should have low overhead because of that. A different way to implement it would be to only call it per connection, right? So we have a mechanism that we give a particular, we choose a particular flow, and then we trigger for that one. Uh, but I haven't given much thought about this uh, particular scenario. So if people have ideas, I'll be interested to know, you know that the best way to do that. Uh, I'm more interested on the fallback for congestion control for my personal reasons. Uh, other callbacks that we have in mind, I should probably stay in the same place, um, are for example, for TCP CA event. 
Although that one probably not because it's too common, right? If we had DC TCP, we'll get a callback every time we get a, a packet that has CCN enabled, right? So it's, it would be called too often. So probably it makes more sense for, for the uh, CA state whenever the congestion avoidance state changes. Uh, and that's a good time to like, if we're going to recovery or CWR, they, then we can grab information about what was the previous congestion window and why it happened. Uh, another one that to me is very interesting is that if we could trigger a callback every RTT as opposed to every packet, right? So it would be less granular that, that per packet, but every RTT really allows us to get a lot of information, right? Like things in TCP don't happen very often, you know, more than once per RTT usually. Uh, and for example, when I look at pickups, typically the first thing I do is just print out information state for every RTT, right? Like how many packets we sent, how many acts we got, what was the RTT? And just l looking at the, the duration of the RTT uh, can tell me that, you know, we're triggering delayed acts, we're, you know, triggering other reasons like that. Yes. I did look at this TCP CA state thing, right? And I, uh, it's a it's a bit, and the BPF validator gets really mad at me when I try to pass a bit around. So I, this might be an implementation issue, right? So I had to do it like is full sock. You have you you can't put it in the in the data part of it. You have to put so it. So the in CA there. state, you know, I mean, we have a few states. It's more than one bit, right? I mean, we can go from open to disorder to CWR. No, no, but this uh -huh. this the, C, the TCP ICA state in the TCP sock structure is a single bit. There was, there was some, some stuff about, so I think it, may, it might be about a set of bits, maybe two yes. or three bits. Yes, yes. But when uh -huh. you start trying to pass bit fields, it already gets upset. The, uh, so so uh, TCP VPF has support for passing things back and forth. Right, so, so, so that, that might be an implementation issue. We might be able to get around that. But the other thing was uh, it calls it when it enters loss recovery, but not when, it's, when it goes back to normal. So... So it, that was another thing. I, I think that was done deliberately, maybe, because you only want to ha take the hit of calling eBPF when bad stuff happens, and you don't want it. I mean, we can control day. whenever you get out of last recovery. I mean, the, okay. the, the CA state does change. Okay. Right. So, so yeah, I don't think there's a current callback for that. Right? No, no, no. There's not. So okay. this is like things okay. I'm okay. planning to to do. Yeah, those are two things, I, and I'll be talking about. This okay. Part. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Uh, you mentioned that you wanted to dynamically change the congestion control algorithm back to cubic if something went yes. wrong. Uh, has that been tested? Like, how, how did it even work? Would you reinitialize all the state and uh, start from the initial condition window? Yeah, yeah. So, so there's already support in the kernel to change. You know, there's a, a such a caption to change the condition control, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and typically what it does, it initializes everything like, because you have no previous state. So, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the TCB BPF things you were talking about earlier, I thought some of them were already implemented. Are so the ones I mentioned before about right. what we have, is what is there, like in the background. Mm -hmm. And then the stuff I talk about per packet, uh, CA state, etc. those would be new things. I see. And do you have a sense for when that might happen? Uh, hopefully this half. Hopefully what? This half. I mean, so sometime within the next few, uh, one or two months. Ah, lovely. Thank uh, you. So. Uh, depending on Eric, right? So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do we have a pool here for Okay. Uh, you mentioned it's, uh, there's a callback for RTTs. Is it wall time? Or I don't have it, right? Okay. But, but I think it would be valuable. So, so the idea is that we don't want to have too many callbacks, right, because of performance reasons. So the reason I didn't put in the past per packet or, you know, per send packet or receive that packet is because I was concerned about the overhead, and I knew I would get, get some pushback. But I think there's also value, and I will talk more a little bit about it, where we can do, do more intelligent analysis in the BPF program to decide what to lag, because lagging too much is expensive. You know, you were talking about the memory, you know, that we need to copy things. Uh, so we can make some initial determination uh, in the kernel, in the BPF program, to decide, for example, 
try to determine when we are in an atypical situation, right? Uh, we could compare the performance of all of the flows stuck into a particular, uh, particular net, and if we are too far out of range, you know, like some average is X number of standard deviations away from, it, from the average, uh, we, we may want to do something with more detail. So we want to have a mechanism that we can track a better collection in a smart way, uh, and an intelligent way. And, and do you envision that thing when you implemented that to be packet RTT or wall time RTT? So when, when the RTT thing? Yeah. So it would be like typically th the way we do it with PCP is like, you know, we start at some point and we send sure. a packet, we receive the act, that's one RTT, it's right? So it is triggered RTT. totally by, by the packet and the act coming okay. back. So it's not wall time? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, no well, because there's no fixed RTT, sure. yeah. right? I guess if we can put back how we are, okay. And this is what I was talking about right now, is that we want to be able to do some smart filtering in TCP BPF to only log re relevant ev events, right? I don't want to be capturing the, you know, the stats of every flow if they are behaving fine, right? There's a lot of work. There. We want to be able to, to detect atypical flows, abnormal flows, and then start collecting more data for those. Uh, and the idea is like right now we could do it triggered by, you know, an abnormal number of RTOs or retransmissions, uh, but maybe we want to be able to be smarter about it, right? Uh, we also, you know, also statistical connect, uh, collection of data, so that you do one every 1,000, every 10,000 flows, it would be nice to have, but it would be nice to have like the whole life maybe of, of that particular connection, uh, as opposed to just random times for different connection, which is what we can do right now. Uh, so for example, I mentioned before, too many RT RTOs, too many retransmissions, where too many could be based on an average of like from a particular data center to talking to a particular destination, you know, what is the average we have? And if it's abnormal, then we start collecting more information for that one and lagging it. Uh, so it could be based on reordering, you know, MSS, sometimes we get situations where you know, the MSS starts decreasing badly because some packets are not getting through and really hurts the performance. And we want to catch those as soon as possible. Okay, and I did say I would finish quickly. Uh, so the pro pro programmability of BPF is opening new opportunities. You know, uh, at Facebook we're using it for many, many different things. And I think this is especially true for TCP analytics and, and logging, collecting information. We can be smarter about what we log. We can do, whereas it would be difficult to put this instrumentation in the kernel with a BPF because it would be fixed. We want the flexibility to experiment with new ideas. And BPF is the ideal candidate for this. Um, and so, like I mentioned, there's a whole bunch of new features planned for this year. and. Uh, We'll see how many Eric let, lets us implement. And I think uh, that's it. Yes. Any questions? Uh, for TCP analytics, do you think uh, you'll have the user have some capabilities, or you, you allow everyone to uh, install a program? Uh, the problem right now is that we don't have that fine grained control. So that you're a TCP BP program, you can change, you know, many things. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we will need to give it. I mean, for our environment, it doesn't matter. The people who will be doing it usually, you know, have full control, and you know, we have real privileges, right. so it's not an issue. Uh, yeah, we would need to see that there's a a need to to be able to have a more finer control, so that certain things are allowed or not, and. You know, we would need to modify TCP BPF so that some functionality is only available depending on your capabilities, mm -hmm. and uh, we need to visit that issue. So I think that can be very useful because this would be a replacement for TCP info, timestamping, and all of uh -huh. that, and those are generally available. You yes. don't need any capability. That's a good point, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, I'll second that. Um, being able to separate the functions allows not just, it's not just a question of whether you have privilege or not, it's a question of whether you want the program to run with that privilege or not. 
We, we should be able to, in the verifier, to check the capability of who's loading the program, yeah. and they're only allowed certain operations, right? Like you can read fields, but exactly. maybe you don't call yep. set socket option or those things. So it, it should be easily. That'd be super useful, actually. Okay, okay. Yep. Uh, I'll look into that then. Uh, you plan something like to uh, attach a TCP, TCP BPF uh, program to a part particular socket, or it still works with C groups? Right now, it's just for C group. Um, I, I mean, haven't given any thought for a particular program, actually, you know, for a particular uh, connection. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, how easy it would be. Uh, mm -hmm. It would have to be a totally different mechanism for the four C groups. So, yeah, I'll have to look into it. What is your use case? Um, for example, if you don't want to use C groups, just, uh -huh. just uh, uh, you, because you don't interested it in any uh, uh, connection, any TCP connection, yeah. just one. For example, you can listen on a uh, socket, a server socket, or a proxy. Yeah. My initial goal was to allow uh, like a global TCP BPF program. Yeah, that would be nice also. Uh, <laughs> and that's what I wanted to do in the initial patch set, but I was overruled. Mm -hmm. And you know, they said that now nah, nah, C groups, you know, that's the way of the future, so. Okay, thank you. Sure. Actually, I should say that if you, just add a, C, uh, a root C group, it just works for everything. It, it's trivial to make it work for everything, not just C groups. Yeah, you can have just a one C group, you know, like the root C group, and that's it, right? You don't have to create different ones. I have one question about uh, TCP repair uh, stuff for uh -huh. the um, checkpoint restore. Uh -huh. um, do you have that with uh, all this infra, the TCP BPF stuff? Can we freeze a TCP flow and then unfreeze it later with all the, this infra back? Or how is it work, <coughs> working? I'm not sure I fully, you, you, you mean with TCP BPF or I'm not sure I understand? So right now uh, you can freeze a program with a TCP repair. Yes. So you can freeze a TCP session. Yes. Uh, migrate a VM, whatever, and uh -huh. restore the, the program yes. as if it was not interrupted at all, at all. Meaning yes. that uh, the program restarts where it was f froze. Yes. But uh, what um, about BPF function that you loaded? Do we do we? Well, we, usually, we usually don't have any. So most of the TCP, TCP BPF programs I write have no state typically, so you would need to be running the same program on the host where you move the connection to, and then it would be in the same situation. It would keep running, right? But once you have state, you have to migrate the state, and I don't think that's being done. So that's something that would need to be done. That's a yeah. good point. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll look into that. Thank you. So I'm going to follow up on the talks from Google and DCP BPF to how does this work? Okay, to talk about um, some other use cases for both of this infra where I was looking at it. Right. So I was looking at some client-server use cases where we were uh, examining high availability use cases, where you had a primary and a backup, and their state needed to be in sync. right? And um, the, uh, the state was computed with a lot of CPU-intensive algorithms. So if the state was not in sync, HA would fail, people would complain, and then you get to figure out if it's an application bottleneck or a network bottleneck. So we won't talk about the statistics that you need to figure out the application bottleneck because you're net dev. So let's look at the network statistics that are helpful in this case. So there were two sub-problems. One is what, stati what statistics to collect, and the next one is how frequently to collect this. So when I was looking at it, the TCP chrono stuff is especially useful. It's very neat that it splits up the connection time into the time that you were busy sending data, 
in the time you were Arwen Limited and the Senbach Limited. So if you see high values for Arwen Limited and Senbach Limited, the chances are high that it's an application bottleneck. Of course, you could have bugs in your auto-tuning and stuff like that, but it's very likely that it's an application problem. If your busy sending data time is high, that doesn't mean your network was good and you're fine as far as the network is concerned because the busy sending time counts both the good put as well as the time in lost recovery. Right, so um, I had a discussion with Neil Cardwell from Google. I said, can we split up this busy time into the good put time and the, uh, the congestion avoidance time? And he said, yeah, we looked at it, we talked about it, we argued a lot about it, there was a lot of ambivalence, there's no way to split it up, so we backed away from it. Right. So one thing that would be useful for me, if, if sometime during this workshop or afterwards, if somebody could explain to me what were the ambivalences, things that you should be aware of, where are the places where it's not clear what's going on. Right. And of course, Neil pointed out to me that even if your busy sending time is high and you don't have any packet loss, you may not be using the network effectively simply because you may be taking a scenic route or you may have deep buffers or other problems that um, are not necessarily a healthy network. So what was suggested to me was to compute the good put using this expression that you see here. And Neil said, okay, compare that with the maximum possible through good put you can get, which is good to know if you know the maximum possible good put, which is possible if you have a dark fiber or dedicated line. But if you're sharing this with somebody and your good put varies depending on the time of the day and the, time and the day of the month, you need some samples to compare the variance in your good put. So that takes me to the second problem, how frequently to sample this. Right? And this is tricky. If you sample too frequently, your sampling itself will be a performance bottleneck. So as uh, Sohail pointed out, there is a cost to doing things like TCP info. You don't want to be the problem yourself just because you're trying to find out if things are fine. And if you sample too seldom, you don't have enough data. Right? So for example, if the connection is running for several hours and you just have one sample on TCP close, which is frequently what people do, that's enough, not enough to tell you what happened. It's like taking one blood sample and telling me, I know your whole medical history. Right? So uh, then also if you have too many short connections and you're doing a lot of the sampling on close, there is too much sampling going on and you don't want to be doing that. It's not even useful because most of the time the network is doing fine. Right, so you really only want to monitor things when interesting things happen. So interesting things are the most obvious way to say something interesting is going on is you see a lot of retransmissions or you see a lot of ECN counters going up. Right, so the rest of the time you want to poll less frequently. Right, and you want to define this thing of what is interesting through filters. And here the TCP BPF infra actually comes in very useful. Right. So Laura just talked about the whole infrastructure, and then I added the async notification um, back in like November. And with that, I was able to actually write some pretty useful stuff. If you look in the kernel K self tests, there is actually an example which doesn't do all of this, but does most of it. Right. So what you can do is you can um, set up your TCP kernel module to look at the state counters, for example, the retransmit counters, and based on that, send a perf event back up to user space. But you don't even have to send that perf event up for each time you see something interesting going on. You can use the uh, BPF map types. You can use a hash table. You can track the state, and periodically, the application can check on things. And to solve the problem of just monitoring on a particular socket, what I was doing was I was setting up the uh, fold, I was using the four tuple to set up the hash, table, hash lookup, and the callback would only update the perf table if there was a match. Now, of course, this means that you get called for each socket, and then you see if there's a hash entry, and then you go and update it, which is not as efficient as saying, I only call you if the socket is interested in this, but it's better than nothing. Uh, so this was actually quite useful and quite powerful. Um, but it still had some rough edges, right? The way things are set up with uh, the whole eBPF DC, uh, infrastructure today is that the perf events, you need one perf file descriptor per CPU, right? So if you have 256 CPUs, you, need, you have end up needing 256 file descriptors. And to set them up is, is not a simple thing. There's a lot of shared memory perfing. There's a, the APIs are, there's like five or six APIs that you have to call before you're ready to do this. Right, and, and if this, is, this is clumsy. So if I'm trying to do this monitoring in addition to like regular file and disk and network IO, I have all these 
n file descriptors plus my other useful work file descriptors all going on, then my dispatcher gets more complicated. So when I was writing this, I found myself wishing that this was more POSIX-like. So that's one area that could use improvement. Right? The other thing is that just intuitively, TCP info is much easier to use. It's a simple API. It's like Netlink sockets. You, know, you do a send message, you get back something, or you set up TCP Diag. You have a clearly defined data structure. You just read it, and you're good. Right? With TCP BPF, you have to really know what the kernel is doing. Sometimes you have to massage the kernel data into other stuff to get the real time. So for example, all the stuff that's tracked in the kernel for rate interval MSS cache, if, if, what's Ohio, if what's Ohio side is confusing, what's in the kernel is even more confusing because you have to transform it to get the real uh, time that, is, that you want to look, look at. And then there was the stuff about CA state. Right? It's a, a couple of two or three bits, I don't remember how many. Uh, to pass that through the BPF validators takes some gymnastics. It's not obvious. Right? And the uh, third thing here is just um, it's, I guess it's not their fault. This is all being, this is like building the plane as you're flying it, so it's constantly in flux. But it is kind of painful if the infrastructure keeps changing, right? There was stuff that I, was wor that I had working with LLVM4, suddenly I had to move to LLVM6, so that there is some turbulence there that you have to be prepared to deal with. So, there should be one more slide. Okay, so seems like they don't have the last slide I updated lately. So in conclusion, right? So what I was hoping we'd get out of this workshop is, is this problem interesting? What are the pain points? How can we unify all of this? So one of the things I was finding myself wishing is, I wish we could just use the TCP VPF infra for async notification, but have something simple being sent up, like the TCP info. I even tried an RFC patch set at one point, but even I was not happy with it, where you had your TCP VPF program send a bit return a bit value, and based on that bit value, you trigger async notification, but then you shouldn't be using two, two types of system calls to get your answer. So that wasn't really a perfect solution either. So one of the things I'm looking for is suggestions, and you know, how interesting is this problem? How much do we want to invest in this? Do we want to really improve the perf 50 APIs and things like that? So looking for comments here. Questions, comments? Good question. TCP BPF versus eBPF. Uh, TCP BPF is Oh, I'm eBPF, sorry. That, right? They have an older version of the slide. I mean, TCP BPF versus TCP Info. They, they didn't oh, okay, get okay. <laughs> I was <laughs> no, confused. They are the same thing. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, I'm not sure you understood your issue with the bits. Yeah, in the, uh, in the filter that C, you, you, you need to convert, you know, like you need to add a new field into the SAC apps. No, it didn't, right? that, that didn't work for me. The validator just got really mad at me. I wasn't able to add it as just another field like, like the uh, retrans and uh, things like that. Because the validator checks to see if the size correctly matches. No, no, but, but you, if your field is like small, you will need to, in filter.c, you will need to have a, the code to convert it. Right. Okay, we should talk about this okay. afterwards. I tried this, and in any, in any way, after Neil pointed out to me that you really want to be looking at good put, I backed away from trying to pass CSD to run. Okay. Because, uh, as I was telling Eric, first of all, if you look at a CA state, it's not even obvious what those bits mean. And if, they, if, they, if you pass it up and you tell me it's not an ABI, so don't look at it, <laughs> I'm not sure I want to go there. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> That mic? About the simplicity of uh, Netlink like interface. I, I think Craig Gallek added uh, two years ago something to get uh, TCP info when you close a circuit. It's a broadcast. Uh, yeah, sent to I, any yeah so, so that's, that is the async notification. That is the only async notification. Yeah, so I think th th this could be easily extended. To no, no, so, so that's, that's where I started, right? Uh, but if you have a connection that's been running for like eight, 10 hours, and you have one sample at the end of uh, the yeah, TCP but close. Just, just let me finish. Uh, okay. You extend this mechanism to get uh, the, the additional samples whenever you detect some anomaly on your, on your flow, not at the end of the flow, but whenever you want. Just right, right, call right. this function to, to spread a broadcast to any uh, listeners. You mean you want to add more callbacks, more async callbacks? Is I don't quite understand what you're saying. It's just a callback. Uh, you need to explicitly call just this function to generate one event, one TCP info to any netlink uh, receiver. 
Yeah, but you'd have to have, uh, sprinkle more calls throughout the stack, right? Saying broadcast. Yeah, yeah but I think it could be done quite easily. Okay, I was afraid. I, mean, you'd, you'd, I was afraid you'd, you'd to stop that. It's probably more easy than having to deal with a LVM for all the sure, six or sure, whatever. Sure, sure. But I, I thought that there would be a pushback that this is going to impact performance if you start doing that. And yeah, that might be a, that would be a perfectly fine. But solution. I think you can implement that without changing the fast path. You can implement okay. that dynamically when when you want. Okay. So Eric, you'll accept uh, small changes to TCP info. You, you just suggested a new, brand new event there. Yeah, he's, he's okay with that. He's okay with that. Okay, good. All right, good. Because this all effort is to avoid changing anything. I I, I can yeah. give an additional uh, detail about TCP info uh, having to lock the socket. Actually, it was done because of 32-bit kernels. Because many fields on this uh, structure are 64-bit fields. And so it's very hard to read 64-bit field on a 32-bit kernel while these fields are changed by soft interrupt. So that's why it was done. But I think that we could just remove this lock for 64-bit kernel. So that should be easy to do. We can get rid of it for 64-bit kernels. OK. Anyway, this, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some challenges in TCP info in this. OK, so I'm not allowed to say which telco, but this is in a telco environment. How do I change that thing, right? The green one. The right that one, yeah. yeah. The, big, the big green one. The big green one, yeah. okay. All right, so uh, this is how we, so this is how we, um, we, we have, this, the environment is, is a proxy environment. You have a big, you have a proxy. You have a proxy. On one side, the telcos have what they call the mobile side. It could be a VLAN. It could be a port. On the other hand, you have the network side. The big bad internet is on that side. Uh, the proxy, on, uh, we collect stats from uh, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Okay? So the interest here is, uh, uh, this is not of interest to you, but we also collect that stats. And like Chris, we push to a time series database. So I w unlike Chris, we're interested in all flows, okay? Not just th anything above 30 seconds. So we poll, we depend on those uh, events, the TCP, uh, TCP info events, uh, and we also poll every five seconds. Um, here's, here's some specs. 100,000 transactions per second on each side, okay? That means 200,000 uh, seen, uh, accepts, or, or, um, or connects that happen per second on, the, on, on one box. You have one million active flows. These are just flows that are still hanging there. They haven't been disconnected. So a total of two million. This is sort of the upper bound. On practice, it could be a lot lower than this, but we spec for this kind of stuff. Uh, we need to see the beginning of the flow and the end. Uh, the end is easy if we forget to poll or we are too slow. There's an event, there's an ethnic event that happens that we listen to. It seems everybody is using that, uh, that event. Um, the beginning is kind of hard. It, if we time it and we poll at the right moment, we will get this, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be able to acquire this uh, stat. Um, but uh, often with short flows, we miss them, right? We sample every five seconds. Is that six second magic uh, billing uh, um, number that telcos like. And our goal is not to lose any event. These stats are stored in a time series database that is mostly for debugging. I don't know what else it's used for, but our job is to get it there. Okay. So uh, issues with INET diag, events get dropped, right? You, you can see that from the sheer number of those flows, uh, closing about 200,000 a second, hitting TCP close, uh, that uh, you will, you're bound to lose events. This is a broadcast pass. Um, so 
uh, polling takes a long time. When you have two million flows you're polling, you can start putting filters. But even then, there's, there's challenges that I'm going to talk about in a second. Uh, one of the ch problems we have is connection setup. When, a, when accept happens or connect, there's no event that gets generated. So again, it depends on the poll. Now, had a patch for this uh, based on some work Somini did with eBPF. I looked at it and said, oh, oh, I could just reuse that. And it generated an event for every, accept or, uh, for every uh, connection setup. Right? So, so I have that event, Eric. I can, push, I can push that patch upstream if it's exciting. So, it will, so now we have two events, one when the socket uh, uh, create happens, not the create, but when it enters either the, uh, when, when it hits connect or, uh, or accept one of the established states, right? Uh, this is useful to us, but again, sensing that I'm gonna have to go through a long discussions, never pushed that. Um, another issue with init DAG is uh, the filtering. If you have two million flows and you're trying to do a get of these flows from the kernel, you want to do some filtering. I can't say things like give me. So what, what we do is we shard, right? We have multiple sockets, each one of them trying to filter to a subset of these flows, right? So, I, but I can't say like give me a, just A B C D slash. Uh, give me all, but the following subset of flows. That, that, the negation is missing. The DSL that Alexi had in there is kind of useful but insufficient. Uh, for, for it does a positive expression but not a negative. You can't have a negation. And if you want to shard across uh, multiple sockets, then you need to play games by observing what flows exist and have each socket only be responsible for a specific set of subflows. Uh, I, I I want to disagree. The negation exists. Negation uh, exists. Yes. Okay. We we have to talk then after this. Uh, so there's other other stuff that comes with uh, uh, with the TCP info. Uh, when the socket gets closed, we don't have congestion information. Now there's a lot of different types of congestion algorithms being used, and if we missed to poll, we would have liked to see what congestion algorithm was used in dismissing in TCP info. I sent a patch on this and it was a, a bit problematic and I, I don't have time to follow up. So I, we have it working in our, in our scenario so I didn't pursue that discussion for long. PID, we also wanna know which, which uh, the process ID and the name of, uh, of the process that's responsible for a flow or the, the proxy. And you can actually get, you, you do get this information but you have to go and grok slash proc to find details of the uh, process name and, PI and, I and PID. It's extremely expensive. It's, a, it's an order n cubed algorithm or something of that sort. So it would be nice if we could pass this information from the kernel. The kernel already knows. Um, right, and I, I'm, I'm not asking it has to be returned for everybody. It's just optionally. So I yeah, go ahead. SS shows the congestion control. It do, it, yes. Did it, you proc? Uh, no, not for the events. The events don't have it. Oh, okay. when, when the socket closes, when, the, when you hit TCP close, the socket gets destroyed, there's one last event that gets sent, but it doesn't have the congestion oh, okay. algorithm. SS will show you the process name and, and PID when you do SS minus 10 or something. No, I mean, if right. you do SS dash T MOI, like MOI, it right. shows the congestion control algorithm for the live connections. Right? Because the connection, st the connection is still active at that point. Right. Okay. You can get it if you do a dump, oh, you'll get it, but not when it when the event gets. So you run the CC after yeah. connections is shut down. And I had a patch that I posted actually. Um, so uh, some resolutions we you make the socket buffer big, okay? We uh, that patch that uh, email thread if you want to take a look is where we. Um, where I had the, the congestion algorithm being sent in the event. Uh, so again, we tried to shard with multiple apps. So one of the solutions to overcome uh, the little DSL that's built into TCP info was to use classical BPF. So with classical BPF, when we receive the SKB, we could drop the packet in the kernel without having to uh, one of our sharded uh, sockets to listen to. Um, yeah, the, the, the DSL is very useful. It's unlike other 
Netlink uh, subsystems out there, it's, it's a really, it has some very uh, nice properties. We could select uh, at a socket level whether which source and destination IP and which source and destination port. I think, uh, and I thought they're only positive, but Eric says you could do negative as well. Right, so again, I took Somini's patch when she was playing with the EBPF and I was able to get it to just auto-generate this event. And it works with no change to SS, by the way. <laughs> if you run SS monitoring, it just works. You can see the socket showing. Uh, when the socket uh, enters established state, you, you'll see the event. Um, so uh, after going through this exercise, uh, and having some discussions with Somin here. So let me look at eBPF, right? So, so my first attempt was to take um, your, uh, to, to, to just, to, I, I only wanted to use Netlink, okay? So I was using eBPF as a backdoor to generate Netlink events. Uh, um, and again, then we started playing around with um, uh, eBPF actually generating these events the connection setup and teardown. Um, my experience with the BPF hasn't been very positive. I'd like to talk to other people. I mean, I have to put everything in the kernel, like different clangs, uh, versions. Uh, I run Debian 9. Maybe it's not many people are using Debian 9. So um, the tooling didn't seem to work well for me, right? But uh, I, I will download a new kernel and see how that goes. Um, I still have time. Okay, so the my initial attempts with the eBPF for events, it's I, I noticed a lot more drops. Uh, however, uh, I do see a lot of promise with the eBPF approach, where you, from user space, you open a, a ring to the, to the kernel, and from the kernel, I can send whatever I want to it. So there's some a lot of promise in, in, in what eBPF would allow me to do that some other people may have no interest at all. So the, the events do work. They require some tweaking. And the tooling is still, in my laptop at least, is still work in progress. And I, I, I'm, I, I would claim I'm above average user. I've downloaded all, I have like four or five versions of Clang in there. And, it, uh, and my goal is to isolate code that doesn't depend on the kernel. Maybe I could talk to you after this. Okay, that's it for me. Any questions? Well, I, we give back the time. <laughs> Thanks. talk about TCP analytics at Microsoft. Um, so this is more of an experience talk, not much code here. Um, uh, it's surprising that for a protocol that was like invented in the 70s, uh, we still haven't solved analytics. But this is a pretty big problem today, uh, every day in production for us. Uh, so these are the two kind of class of problems that we deal with pretty much ev every day, day in, day out. Uh, the first class is connectivity, uh, and the other is performance. Um, so generally, applications in the cloud, when they connect, uh, when there are connection failures, uh, you know, you get a question, hey, why did my app fail to connect? Uh, and typically, the, uh, I've tried to list some of the common re reasons why that happens. There's, of course, network, network or infrastructure issues, like your package could be getting dropped in the network. Um, sometimes, uh, there is no listening socket. Uh, this actually becomes a very challenging problem to debug because uh, a process could have died, like your listening process could have died, um, and then um, and and the analysis is post factum, right? So by the time process could have spun back up as a, as a recovery mechanism, and then you don't know why the socket actually failed. So this means we need some sort of historical information to be able to tell that uh, there was no listening socket. 
Uh, listen backlog, uh, this is again like a, a sockets API thing. Uh, if your server application hasn't correctly set the listen backlog value, uh, it's possible that if there are too many half, half established connections that you might see failures like this. Again, a difficult problem to debug. Um, Firewall rules are a pretty big problem. Um, this could be infrastructure firewall rules or this could be application layer firewall rules. Uh, this falls outside of TCP protocol uh, sort of debugging but ends up being a pretty common case why connectivity would fail. Uh, port exhaustion, this is a big one. Uh, so ephemeral ports outbound typically are limited to uh, 16K based on the IANA uh, ephemeral port range. Uh, so if the application is making a lot of outbound uh, connect calls, or if there's a socket leak, which also happens to be a very common uh, you know, application bug where socket handles are leaked, and then you quickly run out of ports. So having something in the operating system to signal this event uh, or, or collect this at scale is really, really critical. Uh, routing misconfig, uh, this is less common, uh, but there are cases where you won't have a route to the destination. Um, and uh, this ends up looking to the application like a, um, some, sometimes it would look like a firewall block, but it's actually a routing problem. Uh, and then there are uh, cases where uh, NIC drivers, because there's a lot of like stateful processing being done today on uh, middle boxes and NICs, uh, there are cases where you might uh, hit a connectivity problem because uh, the NIC failed to allocate resources. Uh, and the other class is why, why is TCP throughput so low? Uh, this is another, uh, you know, I think this is what all the previous talks have been talking about. Is this is what the, uh, you know, the workload owners at the end of the day need to know is like why, why is the performance so bad? Um, application issues. So I've noted too, like not posting, you know, data fast enough or not draining fast enough. Those are not just the only reasons. Uh, uh, applications uh, typically do not make any as or do not actually know how TCP works underneath. For example, delayed acts, right? So if you have a send and you're a delay sensitive application, you might want to split the send into two sends uh, to, to, to not hit the delayed act problem. But uh, applications typically, even today, uh, have no idea about how TCP works underneath and uh, you know don't change their sending pa patterns to overcome those sort of problems. Even today we see problems where uh, silly window syndrome kicks in or, you know, uh, delayed act kicks in and then there's a latency problem. Uh, TCP receive window auto-tuning. Um, yeah, there are algorithms in every operating system today, but even today we find that there are cases where the receive window does not uh, grow correctly. And there's also a lot of uh, misinformation out there that causes people to disable auto-tuning. Uh, believe it or not, like window scaling issues were seen in the early 2000s, like when we introduced the option like routers would like reboot and such. Uh, so all that information on the internet is still there. So people actually think that TCP receiving auto-tuning is a bad thing and they go disable window scaling. And then you suddenly see that your throughput is limited to like a 64K receive window. Um, and we see this in practice even today. Uh, so bubbling up statistics on that uh, is again something that uh, needs to be done. Uh, network congestion, uh, this is somewhat outside of control of uh, the end host, uh, but again, uh, this is a pretty common reason, uh, especially when the network is oversubscribed that we see that um, uh, performance suffers uh, when their packet drops, uh, because most congestion control that's deployed today does react pretty negatively to packet loss. Um, application performance issues, uh, I think this kind of uh, is probably the same as the first one, but um, this could also be like threads not getting scheduled um, that could cause um, the throughput could be low. Uh, CPU usage, if the system itself is oversubscribed again, I mean this is another reason why the throughput may not be good. Uh, NIC driver issues. Um, so we have seen cases where, uh, you know, the NIC driver itself could run out of, uh, you know, uh, RX buffers, like it, the RX buffer setting may not be set correctly, so it would start dropping packets. Uh, and that would cause TCP throughput to again uh, collapse. Uh, what's the typical analysis process for this? Um, so for connectivity issues, what we end up typically doing is, uh, try to attempt um, the failure again and collect uh, tracing and packet capture. Um, 
one thing that we have found really, really useful is to be able to look at packet capture and tracing from the operating system at the same time. So we built tooling to be able to do this. Uh, this we find this to be extremely useful. Um, uh, especially, I think, like having details tracing in the connection setup path, uh, where there could be a bunch of various reasons why the connection uh, setup could fail, uh, is extremely useful. Uh, for performance issues, uh, one of the things that we have found very useful is to have a micro benchmark that is written to, uh, you know, rule out any kind of application issues. So, uh, you know, this could be iPerf, for example. Uh, running iPerf with the settings that are uh, good enough to saturate the link is one of the first things we would do to rule out that this is not a network strike problem. Of course, uh, time sequence plots, uh, any sort of analysis of it, there are gaps in the capture. Uh, those are things that kind of stand out typically when there's uh, performance issues. Uh, so um, that would be indicative of either, uh, you know, an application problem or a TCP level problem. But uh, typically, that's what you would look at to figure out why uh, performance is bad. Uh, we talked a lot about TCP info and TCP e-stats, so yeah, those are very uh, widely used to figure out uh, where the bottleneck is, whether it's on the sender, the receiver, uh, uh, or, or, it, uh, or the connection is network limited. Uh, of course, CPU usage profile is another very, very useful thing. Uh, this is for like you know, uh, weighted call stack analysis, where the CPU is being spent, uh, or uh, you know, flame graphs. So basically, that shows the distribution of where in the network stack most of the processing is occurring. That is useful for finding like perf bottlenecks that are at very, very high data rates. So some of the challenges that we face today. Um, so uh, the data rates are increasing. So uh, 40 Gbps plus uh, collecting any sort of tracing or packet capture at that data rate is extremely uh, challenging. Uh, we end up with a lot of lost events. Uh, you know, the kernel is not able to keep up. There's also a production performance impact when you turn on tracing and capture. So uh, one of the solution that we have been looking at is filtered tracing. Um, being able to specify the four tuple of interest or uh, a two tuple of interest and being able to only collect capture or tracing for that limited set of traffic uh, somewhat solves this problem. Uh, there might also be um, uh, use in like uh, having tracing that can only trace uh, particular events, for example, retransmits or, or uh, congestion window events. Uh, large trace and capture files, these are again a problem at, at, at that kind of data rate. Um, one of the solution we have now is uh, automated analysis that can parse these kind of captured files automatically and list uh, all the uh, connections of interest and what their performance characteristics are. Uh, in the cloud, one of the problems we face is that, uh, so as I said before, one of the first steps we do is to try to reproduce the problem when there's like a connectivity issue or a performance issue where the repro is sometimes not consistent. So it would happen like, you know, once every 24 hours. And it's not really possible to run the tracing running like uh, all the time. Uh, so one of the possible solution there is something like a flight recorder, which records uh, TCP stats of interest and keeps it in memory even after the connection dies. So you can do some kind of like post analysis uh, after the incident and go back and filter for the four tuple that failed and look at its stats. So this is something that uh, we have recently built and we find it very useful. Um, TCP stats, uh, so sometimes we have a problem where we have no control over the sender. Uh, so if you're on the receiver, uh, the TCP stats are not very useful. Uh, like there's no congestion uh, control information available on the receiver. Uh, this is a problem that we have not yet solved. Uh, one of the option here would be to, uh, well, a TCP option has pretty limited space, so I don't think uh, that's going to be very feasible, but maybe if the application protocol is like HTTP2, uh, then we might have a frame or something that could communicate kind of statistics from the sender to the receiver. This will require like, protocol standardization work, uh, but if you are on the receive side of the connection, let's say your server is like receiving data if it's an upload from a client, then uh, the visibility into why TCP performance is bad is very, very limited. Uh, so having this sort of network communication to communicate the stats might be very, very useful. Uh, 
So yeah, topologies are a problem. So things are getting extremely complicated because of uh, virtualization as well as containers. So you have multiple layers of nesting. Uh, so even on, on an end host, uh, the network topology has become extremely complicated. Uh, so having the ability to like trace the path that a network packet takes uh, through the host stack uh, is again something uh, that, that would be very, very useful. I think that's about it. Any questions? So the flight recorder idea is pretty interesting. Uh, was it TCP states or was it TCP stats that you were recording? And if it was the latter, how big was the buffer? Yeah, so the TCP statistics, it is TCP statistics. Uh, and it is basically a buffer that's very similar to TCP info. So it's a subset of all the possible statistics that we track today. And the amount of memory to uh, use to collect those statistics is configurable. No, but so roughly how many records were you holding? Because if you're holding this in an internet facing thing, there, that is like th Correct. tens of thousands of connections right. coming and going. Yeah. How do you decide which ones to hold? Yeah, so uh, the, the configuration is that you can set a filter. You can say that I'm only interested in this four tuple or this two tuple. So you can set a wildcard filter and collect just the statistics for those connections. Right, so, so I, I understand all of this is configurable. My question was what configuration did you use? Like how big was it in practice that was usable? Like where, where did you end up? I mean, are, is there any data you can share with us about what was a reasonable set? Is this like yeah. a megabyte, gigabyte? Uh, yeah, so I would say like people typically set it to like 1,000, 10,000 connections. It all depends on how much memory there is on the server. So we are finding today that the memory on the servers is pretty high. So there, there, there is ample space. Uh, like e even in VMs, uh, you know, there's ample memory for people to be able to do this. Uh, this, of course, comes from something called as the... It, it, it is kernel memory, uh, so it is costly, but uh, there is enough memory uh, to get like thousands of connections worth of data. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, sorry, uh, I didn't get it maybe. So what are you using for filter tracing? Is it BPF-based tracing, like high-level BPF trace or uh, Sorry, so this, uh, to, to clarify, yeah, this, was, this has not been done on the Linux kernel. I was talking about the Windows operating system. But I think this is, this is something that should be done in the Linux kernel. OK, thank you. Um, the TCP stats collection are using the TCP e-stats headers that are in, what yeah. are you using for the TCP stats? Uh, so there is, uh, yeah, so there is, there is e-stats, uh, which is based on the RFC that you quoted. Uh, that is available. Uh, it does require admin, it does require enumerating all connections on the system to be able to narrow the connection of interest. Uh, there is also TCP info API now uh, that you can query per, on a per socket basis. Okay. So there's both of them available right now, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Josh, Josh Bell for back one. There you are. I have to figure this out too, like everybody else. Go for it. Okay. All right. Uh, hi. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, Jason, um, I work at um, Akamai. Um, I'm a software engineer there. And um, yeah, so we have, um, we've had a stats collection infrastructure on TCP um, for quite some time. And um, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about that. And then um, hopefully, um, given the context and interest in TCP BPF, I'm very interested in that as well. Um, you know, uh, with an eye towards maybe um, converting our infrastructure to use some of that. So,
Hey, I got it. <laughs> all right, so like I said, um, I'll talk a little bit about you know, why we're collecting all these stats. Um, I'll talk about the TCP implementation that we have around stats. Um, ours actually dates back to when the company started, uh, so it's quite old, um, but it's, it's been updated since then, mostly by me. Um, I'll talk about the metrics that we're collecting and then s sort of some of the requirements that we've, we've had on it, um, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to use the TCP BPF infrastructure going forward. Um, that's that's my hope. So, um, so um, to give you a little bit of background about Akamai um, for people not familiar with it, um, so we have you know servers all over the world, and um, we try to um, uh, redirect we cache content for lots of different companies, um, and so one of the inputs into um, figuring out where to uh, redirect users um, is you know some of the statistics that we collect uh, using this this TCP framework. Um, so that's we call that mapping, which is mapping end users to servers. Um, uh, we also use the stats for figuring out uh, where different bottlenecks are. Um, so everybody's talked about that already. Applications network. Um, so, uh, we have. Uh, lots of stats around delivery metrics. Um, I have some charts that I'll show you, graphs that I'll show you. We use it for debugging. And then, as people have mentioned, we also use it for tuning parameters for TCP. So, for example, setting C winds um, and things like that. Um, we can use the statistics or the stats that we gather as input into that um, framework. So, um, that's sort of why we're collecting them. Um, a little bit. So what are we actually doing? So we actually, unfortunately, have two infrastructures right now, uh, both in the kernel. Um, so one of them, sort of for historical reasons, um, but uh, so one is we have this random sampling mechanism um, where you basically it samples every nth connection. Um, I think typically on our servers we have that set around 5%, I think. Um, but it's dynamically configurable. Um, and those stats basically cover the entire connection. So you could think of that as like the TCP info diag, I think it's called, uh, where you know after the connection closes, you can get the TCP info dumped out. Um, that's sort of what that's doing. Um, and then we have this other one, which we call like object-based, um, which is basically um, it's used basically um, we have a set sock op call um, that, that we have that basically says start sampling now and then we have a corresponding one that says stop um, both using set sock op and so the way that works is basically um, you know the application wants to write and what we, we call an object but basically just a, you know a, 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 you know a, an image or something uh, or, uh, you know, it's just a, a set of bytes to the network, and when it says start, it basically snapshots the um, the write sequence number, and then when the when we do the stop, we wait for the ACK for that one, and and so we sort of um, do it based on these boundaries. Um, uh, part of the motivation of this is we don't want to always be collecting the stats, like people said, you get lots of stats, and you know we're trying to minimize the amount of stats that we have. Um, um, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit about those two ones. So first, the random sampling. I think I. Uh, so there's basically callbacks through the TCP layer that we have. Um, you can think of them as like, kind of like the trace points that are in the kernel right now. Um, very similar to that. It's just our own ones that we have. So we have maybe, I don't know, maybe around 20, 25 callbacks sprinkled through the layer. So it's not a, a ton, but there's a fair number. Um, and so those are sort of where we kind of instrument into the code. Um, and uh, yeah, so the structure is like 300 bytes. I'm not sure how big the TCP info is. Does anybody know offhand? Um, I think it's probably bigger, but yeah, I would guess. Yeah, so anyway. Um, uh, and then the way we read it is we have a dev TCP stats, just a character device, which we can read and pull. And, 
And we also have this forward backwards compatibility issue around TCP info. We have the same thing where, you know, we basically the user space and the kernel can agree on our version um, and output that. Um, it's not super interesting. And then this object based one, same rough idea. There's callbacks throughout the TCP layer. Um, it's a little smaller. Um, and as I mentioned, it basically is based around the right sequence number. Um, and then, yeah, so there's optional fields around uh, for different congestion control algorithms. So it's actually a variable size structure uh, depending on which, op which congestion control algorithms are in place. So a lot of this is around sort of customizing what stats we get um, to be um, sort of tailored to what we're doing because we're trying to minimize, like I said, the amount of um, network traffic and stats that we're collecting. Um, and then similarly, it, there's a character device for that, which we can mmap and pull, and actually has a ring buffer that's this lockless ring buffer. Everybody likes to write ring buffers. I do too, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's without getting into the details of it, but basically, it, there's this you know, mmap the buffer, and you know, user space reads it and consumes all the stats. Um, so. Let's jump into some of the metrics. I think they're probably similar to what um, a lot of people are already collecting. Um, but uh, yeah, so how, you know, bytes sent, the retransmits. Um, a lot of these are in obviously the TCP info, um, CWIND, um, Handshake, minimum SRTT. Um, so these, are, these aren't all the fields. I collect a, a bunch of them I wrote down. Um, we also try to get at the, as I mentioned, like are we C win bound? Is, are we um, limited by the receive window, uh, the, the remote receive window? Um, and then, um, yeah, we, we actually have one around TTL. So that's actually the receiver um, TTL field. Um, we count that, like the number of hops, I guess. Um, to see how far things are. Um, so those are some of the stats. So now I'm going to jump into some charts. Um, so these, I didn't actually realize before I started this talk uh, what different groups do with some of these stats. I sort of work in the kernel a bit and produce the stats, but I didn't realize that there's a lot of teams actually consuming them. So I have a bunch of charts that other groups have done or continuously do on the network. This is basically um, continuous monitoring that we do. I did have to cover up the, uh, if you see on the left side, there's sort of a, well, it actually doesn't look too bad, but I didn't want, I didn't actually put in the absolute numbers here just because um, uh, I, I wasn't really supposed to, so I have this X here. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is for like a certain region that we serve traffic from, and so this is gigabytes per second um, over, I guess this, I, snapshot of this uh, earlier in the month. Um, so this might be a little more interesting. Um, so it has, this is basically sent, uh, the uh, throughput um, for various um, objects that we're sending um, through the network. So you can see um, on, let's see, you can see like sort of when things dip down here um, it's actually, um, so this is saying, sorry, uh, for a given throughput, um, how many requests are, uh, what percentage of them are sort of less than that throughput, and um, that's what the lines are. So when it goes down, it actually means we're getting higher throughput because there's more, um, a higher percentage of them are at a, um, a higher throughput. So we use this, or different teams use this within um, the company to understand, you know, what, what kind of performance we're getting, basically. Um, yeah, sure. Is throughput or good and what is, why is it better when it goes down or not when it goes down? Oh, okay. So, um, basically it's saying ha uh, what percent, so the left side is um, the percentage of requests. Request for the um, no, no, the percentage of requests that got that level of throughput. So for example, the, I don't know, just pick any of the lines. Um, it's how many, uh, 
you know, out of 100, out of all the requests that we get, how many are getting that level of throughput? So when it goes down, it's saying, uh, you know, that, that percentage are getting that level, which means there's, you know, one minus that or 100 minus that are getting uh, greater than that. Right. Yep. So why is it so nicely synchronized? Why is everything going up at the same time and going down <laughs> at the same time? That's a good question. Um, I was sort of wondering that too, um, based on this. Um, we'll see. I have a few more charts that actually um, are at, at the same time. So we'll kind of look at that, and I think it'll explain that. OK, perfect. Yep. So I mean, I just snapshotted this from a bunch of charts we had internally. Um, and so I don't really have you know, a lot of color around it, but I think we'll see it as we go along. So this was the next one, so the request size. So you'll see these kind of match up to the previous one, those dips. Um, so, this is, so what's happening is at those dips where I was saying there's actually higher throughput, um, you see that the request size is actually bigger um, at those times. So, um, you know, um, uh, you know, we're serving sort of bigger, I guess the, in aggregate, the, the objects are bigger that we're serving at those times. What? Uh, I guess it depends on what people are happen to be requesting. So, I mean, it's not a huge difference. I mean, it's only moving around a little bit, but it's basically saying that there's the things we're sending out are larger at those times. Um, so, and then uh, this is the RTT, um, and again, uh, so this chart may be a little confusing, but um, it's basically saying the RTT is. Um, greater than uh, the percentage of requests that are um, greater than, the R um, than a given RTT. So each line is a, a certain RTT um, that, that's measured in the network. And so when the lines here dip down, um, it's basically saying that the, um, there's fewer, um, or the RTT um, is, is, is actually getting uh, lower. Um, in this case, so. Let's see here. And then uh, here's retransmits um, um, over time, uh, and um, yeah. And now here's another chart. This one doesn't line up with the previous ones, but it's basically breaking down um, the requests into. Um, if we were application bound, C win bound, or R win bound. Um, so from this chart, you can see um, most things are network bound, or app, yeah, network bound. Um, I don't know if that's expected or not. I, I, I mean, I, I, I would expect that, I guess. <laughs> um, and then um, receiver bound. And then we have this metric around uh, whether you know we're application bound. Um, so luckily that, or I think it's a positive that that's smaller, um, but but I get, there's some percentage of time that we're bound by, you know, the application that we're sending um, with. So that's sort of a little bit uh, around some of the metrics. Um, so this was sort of uh, just some just me thinking about what we would need from TCP BPF to to move our infrastructure um, onto it. Um, so, you know, this is very open. I'm not saying this is how it should be, but it's just kind of my brainstorming. Um, so I sort of had, uh, you know, uh, similar ideas to some, I guess, people have already spoken about this. Um, so, you know, we have these callbacks or trace points um, through the kernel. Um, so I like the idea of having this per socket flag. I know uh, somebody, or Lawrence, I guess, had suggested that earlier. Um, I sort of was thinking along the same lines um, as that, um, because basically we don't want the overhead when we're, you know, 
not tracing it um, or not interested in those particular sockets. Um, so I don't know, that was sort of one idea. The other thing though too that is important for us is to be able to not, so once we get into the BPF program, I don't want to have to go and look up e either in a hash table or something to find sort of my record. So I definitely wanted to have some local storage um, that's sort of per socket. Um, so um, the API I was sort of suggesting maybe is to sort of when we enable these, the tracing to be able to pass in a map. Um, so that was just one idea. So yep. there are plans to introduce per socket storage for BPF. Okay. So you know you will create it and then you can access it directly. So it will replace a lot of the use of uh, maps. Okay. Um, so would we be able to specify one from user space or like a specific map? So it's not a map, but it will be an area okay. on the site that belongs per socket and per BPF program. Mm. So the BPF program can store data, right, that it can access all the time so that if you are want to keep track of like the old stats and the difference to the new stats to trigger something because some country increased too much, mm -hmm. you could do it just locally as opposed to having to have a map that you have to access. And, and there will be a mechanism to read it from user space too. I see. Okay. Um, so that might work for us. Um, okay, so that's just some ideas there. Um, and then I think similarly to, I think uh, people have talked about how do we actually read them. So one idea was to use the perf infrastructure. Um, so the TCP info, like I said before, is interesting, but a lot of, we probably are only interested in, a, or we are interested in a subset of those fields. So we'd like to tailor it to sort of our use case. So we felt, or I was thinking that the, the, the perf output where you can sort of specify exactly um, which, um, you know, which field you want would be a better fit. And, you know, we can mmap and read that. Um, so just comparing, at least for me, um, the, this, you know, trying to use EPF versus what we have right now. Um, so we have, you know, a fairly sub sub substantial out of tree patches for this. Um, so we could hopefully get rid of that. Um, you know, the proposal or, uh, I, I, I sort of was thinking of it as more general than being specific to TCP. I was thinking of it as being a mechanism that could trace all socket types. I'm not sure if that's sort of um, in the thinking for this right now. Um, you know, being able to just use the fields that you're interested in is, is definitely important to us. Um, one concern I sort of had, though, uh, regarding all this is, okay, we implement all this, but now sort of all the logic around um, the metrics is out of tree now, so everybody might be doing it differently. Um, but on the other hand, there are, um, you know, repositories that keep TCP programs and um, trees. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know if that's a major concern, but it's just a point that, you know, I think it's nice to be able to leverage, you know, obviously the metrics that different people are collecting and to be able to reuse that. Um, so I don't really see that as an issue, but I thought I'd mention it. Um, and that's basically all I have. So one comment is all the metrics to show are really a subset of TCP info. So there's really no reason you cannot use TCP info other than that you think it's too much. It's too big a data structure. Is that right? Um, well, I I'm, yeah, so in terms of the metrics we're collecting, um, there are some, I, I believe, that aren't in TCP info. So for example, Handshake RTT um, is one that we look at. Um, is the TTL field in TCP info? I don't, no. I mean, there, there, there's, is the, that actually and this though? is actually a subset of the ones we have. We actually collect more. I didn't list every single one that we have. Okay. but. Um, so there's yeah two issues. One is it's not they're not all in TCP info, and the other one, like I said, is it's it's more you know there's some that we're not necessarily interested in. So um, I, I 
personally like the idea of being able to you know, customize. That's sort of why we have our own implementation to some extent, is that it's very customized to the stats that we're interested in. So if there are things that are interesting but are not in TCP info, it's better to get them into TCP info, right, rather than have these out of free things, one off things. They uh, might be useful to other people as well. Right, that's true. Um, yeah, we, we could try, if people are interested in them, I'm happy to um, try to add them to it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, hi. So uh, I'm quite interested in the semantical deta details of the uh, get sucked opt. So in our case, one of the problems we are struggling is comparing throughput of user which receives a dozen of simple uh, index HTML pages, which each of them is 4K, to a user which downloads a 100 gigabyte piece of data is unfair. So what we are trying to do is we are really trying to measure the counters more per request as opposed to per connection. So it doesn't really fit the TCP info model. You mentioned that in your case, the uh, set sock opt, when you disable the measurements, uh, it synchronizes, it waits for the final acknowledgement. Is that, is, is, does it allow you basically to wait till all the data was currently sent and basically get counters per request as opposed to per, per connection? Yes, uh, yeah, so it's really a, a, a around the request, like you mentioned. So to be specific, the start, you know, snapshots the right sequence number. So the, the statistics really don't start counting until we hit that right one, right? Because there could be a lot in the right buffer already. And then similarly for the, um, the stop, um, we again snapshot the right sequence number, but we don't stop collecting until we hit the final acknowledgement for that. Um, so, uh, and actually our API is pretty general. Um, it can allow overlapping and it, it can deal with all that you know, kind of thing. Um, so you could have two starts in a row or it doesn't really understand what user space is doing, but it'll output the records. So it's, it sounds like that's what you're asking. Do you have any bottlenecks like the socket lock that Sarah mentioned? Oh, um, in terms of locks, um, well, set, set sock op takes a lock already um, by default, I believe, right? Oh, well, actually, certain ones, I think it drops it in certain cases, right? Um, but um, so you're asking around the set so our set sock op? No, no, I was saying, um, like, Google mentioned that in order to get TCP info, oh, they the have get? to take a lock. Yeah, and so that's our. A, that's a cost. Yeah, so we don't have any locks there, like, the. You know, as the st statistics are getting gathered, um, you know, TCP does its own locking um, that already does. Um, and then when we output the records to the... Well, how come you're able to avoid it, but they cannot? There must be a reason. That they in, have, in the get? You mean the get call? In, the, in collecting the yeah. The um, well, the get call... Uh, well, we don't have a get call, basically, um, because we're reading them asynchronously. Um, so... So we don't we don't have that. Okay. So f uh, for the request based, uh, like looking at a sequence number, uh, capturing TCP stats, and then receiving the act for that, and then giving it to user yeah. space. So time stamping with upstats uh, does that. So uh, why don't you just uh, why aren't you just using the time stamping? So you can like uh, on a send message, you can mm. give a C message. There's even not a reason to do an extra syscall. You, you tell, um, I want this send message to be traced, and then you collect the TCP info and on ACK and send, and you have the stats, right? So you're saying, I'm just trying to understand what you're, you're saying, that using the existing uh, send message with time stamping would right. cover the use case? Right. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, if I understand the details of it better, um, it, it might work. Um, like I said, TCP info is a lot bigger than what we need. Um, uh, well, uh, the timestamping, we don't have all of the fields in TCP info, so it's smaller. Okay. Uh, but yeah, there, is, uh, there are certainly fields there that you might not need. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it might. 
I think a lot of them are pretty close fits. Right. Um, I think, like I've kind of, I think the 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 crux for me at least um, is you know with something like BPF we can get exactly what we want. Um, so and I think that's where most people are thinking this is headed. Um, so uh, you know that seems like a good direction. And for the size of TCP info, is it the size of a uh, read and write to RAM that is the bottleneck for you, or storing the? F yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, I, th I think it's more probably around the storage because we have to then pump all these stats through our whole network. So if we double the size of it the, of what we need, um, well, I guess we could drop it before yeah, we exactly. send it, right? That was um, my next question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just more to read out and, you know, trying to be as efficient as possible. I don't know. Any other questions? All right, let's have Jay to do the last talk. This is Jay Chung. Um, I work for a company called Biosat. We are the, um, the company that actually makes the satellite and then provide the broadband um, internet services to, um, let's say, airplanes and stuff like that. Um, okay. So I'm gonna actually talk about a little bit about like you know what we do um, in terms of like you know. Uh, why we need a uh, you know TCP performance and, and and all that stuff. So, if you actually look at uh, you know this um, picture, um, you know one of the thing that we actually provide is actually broadband uh, geo geo satellite uh, you know link based uh, you know internet services, which actually um, provides like hundreds of megabps of speed, with more than 500 milliseconds of RTT that actually give us huge, uh, you know, uh, BDP, uh, which is actually very hard to, uh, you know, manage. And and not only that, but um, you know, the acts are actually coming back with like a 500 millisecond delay. So uh, we are actually any condition control algorithm is actually dealing with 500 millisecond late information. So it's it's actually very, uh, you know, tough. Um, and also, um, any packet retransmission actually happening uh, uh, on the satellite link is going to hold up the uh, the pipe. So it's going to drain the pipe because you cannot really the TCP cannot really uh, you know transmit the new packets um, during the RTT uh, where we actually see the uh, uh, the retransmissions. So after the retransmission, so um, that actually cause um, you know a lot of performance issues. So. Um, in order to um, you know address this performance issue, typically uh, we use um, you know the proxy enhance, enhancing proxy, and also use active queue management to use ECN rather than packet drop on the uh, satellite link. So in this graph, uh, um, you know as you can see, um, uh, the end-to-end -end TCP connections will uh, typically. Um, you know, cut into three different pieces. Um, and, um, you know, the PEP, the two TCP PEP, one in the, um, uh, the hub size and then one in on the, uh, the remote station will actually maintain its own TCP connection. Okay, so basically, uh, you know, that is uh, the setup that we have. And um, I think the majority of, uh, you know, um, uh, the traffic in terms of volume is still TCP, although, um, quick is actually uh, catching up, so it is actually very important for us to actually manage uh, the TCP, um, especially the, the PEP performance. Okay, so um, so that actually gave enough reason for us to uh, monitor TCP performances, um, and also I didn't actually mention here um, going further um, the the infrastructure of uh, you know mobile edge computing is actually coming. Uh, you know, it's pretty big. That means 
um, you know, mobile edge computing means um, in, in, in this um, graph, uh, you know, the TCP PEP, we might actually have a you know, mobile edge computing uh, you know, platform. So using um, standard Linux based, uh, you know, TCP um, with the proxy there would be actually, you know, uh, very much of an option for ISPs as well. And if that's the case, I mean, uh, you know, um, the, uh, the ISPs actually, you know, getting the uh, TCP stat information out of the kernel is actually very valuable, okay? So, um, so one of the reasons that we actually uh, use uh, you know, TCP stat information is to ensure the service of law objectives. Um, and, um, you know, we, want, we wanted to actually make sure that our customers will actually have uh, a high quality of experience. Uh, from transportation services, and also we would like to proactively, uh, you know, detect a subscriber with a, you know, poor, uh, you know, connection, and see if we can actually make them better. Um, and um, and uh, people uh, use active measurement as well. However, active measurement cannot be actually uh, used as a tool to ensure the uh, SLO for monit monitor the SLO or monitor for the um, the QoE of the subscriber. So this is really important for us. Um, so uh, typically, wide transmission level, transmission um, um, layer level statistics, because that's exactly what um, you know our customers are actually seeing in terms of performance. And um, also, we need a, a, you know a layer two statistics. But when we actually marry those two, and also uh, with some physical um, layer statistics, we can actually uh, you know. Uh, debug the uh, you know the our network very much uh, no more um, you know very easily so that's exactly why we are um, using PEP and we are using uh, you know uh, we are monitoring the TCP performance of the PEP. Okay, um, so I would like to actually give a little more picture in terms of SLO. Um, so uh, this picture actually shows like a traditional satellite and then high throughput satellite. Um, in the high throughput satellite, um, these days actually um, you use a something called spot beam. Um, that means um, you know we are actually reusing um, you know uh, the frequency um, uh, in a smaller uh, you know cell so that we can do uh, you know broadband uh, high speed uh, you know. Um, um, Create a high high speed link in that smaller area, and um, and then basically uh, we really have to monitor the uh, the bandwidth uh, and usage uh, performance uh, of each of the beam. So we typically sell, uh, you know, um, we actually load the uh, you know the, our customer into one of these beams, and then we don't want to actually overload these. Beams. If in in that case, uh, you know the performance, the the the, the transmission uh, performance will be really um, go down, and that's probably what we don't want to happen. So we we are actually uh, monitoring something uh, we call uh, speed availability. So um, and and that's basically for uh, samples that we actually measure the speed. Uh, we want the median to be, uh, you know, over the, uh, you know, is actually greater than uh, advertised speed of the uh, service plan that we actually sold. So um, those are the things that we are monitoring, and um, so, and then also for uh, similar um, stats can be actually used for quality of experience assurance. Okay, so um, in order to um, use the TCP stats, what do we really need to actually, I mean, in order to actually measure um, um, the, the speed, uh, what do we need from the TCP stat? Uh, basically, we need a, uh, and, and one of the, uh, the constraints that we have, I think Jamal mentioned it a little bit, but this has, no, I mean, what Jamal did was nothing to do with our company, but <laughs> I'm, I'm in general. Um, so, um, so we need a burst, and we we need a you know, long burst um, to be actually tracked per connection. Um, so, and, and we don't we can't really uh, you know pull too often of each of the connection because we uh, in our business actually has a lot of connections going on, um, and therefore uh, at the end of the connection we would like to actually have. 
uh, uh, statistics about the connection. And, and one of the most important, um, you know, attribute that we need is actually the largest burst within the connection. That means uh, in between the, um, the period of, um, uh, what is it, the um, uh, app limit, we want that the biggest burst and then what was, how many bytes were actually, you know, um, transmitted, um, you know, within, within that burst, what was the burst length and then what was the maximum uh, available bandwidth during the burst. And, and those are the three things that we really need to actually keep track of the, uh, the speed availability. Okay. All right. So, um, so, so each connection will actually dump these, uh, you know, uh, statistics, and then uh, we actually look at the, um, uh, you know, we actually filter the samples such that uh, we we set a threshold um, such that the um, the the burst is actually greater than, let's say, for example, ten seconds, and then we look at the um, the average burst speed. Uh, in that maximum burst speed distribution, and and this is basically uh, you know showing the average uh, you know speed distribution uh, for uh, you know um, 100 megabps plan, and as you can see the median uh, if you if this is a CDF so if you look at the uh, the 50 percent um, then that actually gives us about 100 maybe 106 megabps in median so it's actually meeting our SLO but um, so, but in, um, I haven't actually, I didn't actually show the other uh, the graphs here, but um, we can actually um, look the same graph for each subscriber and then identify a subscriber that really has a poor, um, uh, what is it, the um, um, poor TCP performance in terms of, uh, you know, burst uh, for, for the large burst. and. And uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm actually, uh, you know, currently working on, uh, you know, how to actually, uh, you know, uh, well detect and uh, look into the uh, the debugging for those users as well. But um, so that's basically, um, you know, uh, one of the uh, the key stuff that we are actually doing. Um, so the uh, the collected, uh, you know, um, statistic. Um, how do we actually do that? I mean, as Jamal presented, we can actually do it based on the netlink or uh, TCP, uh, you know, BPF, I think is actually, uh, you know, a very good candidate to actually use it. And then we just stream to um, our data centers for analysis and for real time, um, you know, monitoring and stuff like that. That's basically, uh, you know, what we have for, um, you know, uh, for the architecture. So, um, summary, uh, just uh, introduce like, you know, why we actually need a, uh, you know, TCP stats uh, for ISPs like satellite, uh, you know, broadband service ISPs. One of the biggest thing is actually uh, SLO uh, for speed availability. Uh, we would, and, and also quality of experience assurance and uh, detecting uh, abnormal um, connections and users and debug those uh, you know, connections is actually um, um, why we monitor uh, TCP performances. And um, uh, okay, so that's about it. Yep. Thank you for the presentation. Did you get a chance to try end-to-end um, -end with BBR over these links? It, did you get a chance to ever try end-to-end -end, uh, performance with BBR over these links, or uh, even even just yes. PEP performance, PEP so level performance? Yes. So basically, um, BBR. I was I was really happy to play with BBR because um, you know the satellite. The one of the biggest problem uh, in the satellite is um, basically if the algorithm, if conditional avoidance algorithm is uh, you know reacting to um, packet loss, then packet loss might actually come from um, it, it's, it's not always uh, you know the um, the signal of congestion that actually caused some grief. So um, we I actually um, you know tested the BBR on a satellite link, and then um, the intermediate result is actually pretty promising. It's not as good as the PAP, uh, which is uh, you know. Uh, engineered to actually work well on a specific um, link, but 
uh, I I was able to see 80 to 90 percent of the performance that we wow. used to see. So, That's absurd. yeah, but I cannot really generalize it. I mean, I just did a couple of tests. Yep. Do you terminate uh, TCP connections on the performance enhancing proxies, or do you just pass through routers? Um, yes. Yeah, so we we do terminate the TCP. Okay. And. Uh, do you uh, have statistics on how much of the time connection spend in being received window limited, or uh, do you encounter that often? You mean you mean the um, the basically are, are you talking about the milliseconds or delays or maybe CPU utilization? So how, mu how do you uh, like for in these proxies? Do you up the RMM to a very high value or or large value or um, do you incur any delay because uh, receive window was too small, or you couldn't get updates well, fast enough? Well, I didn't actually, uh, you know, look too much into those statistics okay. yet. Okay. We're running short of time, so can you take your questions offline? We have the next talk set up, so but yeah, you can take your questions. Yeah, you can. Mind. You can actually, you know, we can actually I'll talk offline. offline. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So um, at least what I got out of this is that we can start looking at adding more TCP die callbacks. <laughs> at least for like, like three-way handshake to just get our feet wet. <laughs> All right, I'll take a look.